Estimados delegados, eh, vamos a... Let's uh, resume our work, please, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to begin with uh, the C list of speakers. Second, speakers from delegations. I would like to ask all of you pl to please stick to your time because otherwise we're going to have to cut you off. We're going to begin with New Zealand. You have two minutes. New Zealand to be followed by Denmark. Mr. President and members of the Assembly, tēnā koutou katoa, ki o rāna koutou katoa. I greet you all as the Member of Parliament for Palmerston North from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Over the years, our country has demonstrated that it takes its role in regional security and peacekeeping seriously. And as an honest broker and a mediator, we are a country that is willing to stand on its track record. As a global citizen, our sense of responsibility has never restricted us to our own backyard we have also shown a commitment well beyond our own waters. Our leadership in the area of nuclear disarmament speaks for itself. We have never shied away from this mantra, and in fact, being nuclear free is firmly embedded in our identity as a nation. It's part of the Kiwi DNA. More recently, our focus has been on doing what we can to promote a stable, prosperous, and resilient Pacific, which includes a greater presence in the region. And I want to mihi to our Pacific brothers and sisters who are here as part of this 148th Assembly in Geneva. This approach has seen us focus on regional priorities, priorities such as climate change, economic resilience, health and education, gender, human rights, and a focus on young people, all of importance to the work of the IPU. And to assist with policy and partnership opportunities for the Pacific region where we can. Our experience with select committees that exist within our parliamentary system is that they play a vital role in scrutinising our executive, but they also provide the opportunity for public input into the process. They can initiate independent inquiries into any matters that they consider worthy of scrutiny, ensuring active transparency and a sense of public confidence in the system. Mr President, it is more than desirable for all parliamentarians to reflect upon the role they can play in the areas of peace and security. The reality is that in a global context, such an opportunity is not available to all. This means we must all look for ways to take up the challenge and responsibility, whether it is in our own region or further abroad. Nō reira tēnā koutou, ki o rāna koutou katoto, me takimata. Thank you, Mr President. Muchas gracias. Thank you, and thank you for sticking to the time. Denmark, you have a minute and a half. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little to your bad conscience. I'm glad that so many are here. Ladies and gentlemen, we stand at a critical juncture in human history, facing the urgent need to address the challenges posed by climate change. The time has come for us to embark on a transformative journey towards more sustainable and resilient future. One of the key steps in the journey is to phase out fossil energy from our global energy mix. I suggest by 2035 we will be there. Fossil energy has for sure fueled the progress of human civilization, but it has also contributed significantly to biodiversity destruction, and climate disruption. We cannot continue down this path if we are going to safeguard the future for future generations. It's time to embrace a new era of clean, renewable energy sources. This presents a chance for job creation, technological advancement, and inclusive economic development across the world. We must work together to establish robust regulatory mechanism, carbon tax, and incentives for clean energy adoption. In closing, 
I urge each and every one of us to embrace the challenge of phasing out fossil energy from our energy mix before 2035. Let us seize this moment to be the architects of a brighter and cleaner and more sustainable future for generations to come. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Dinamarca. Thank you, Denmark. I now give the floor to Azerbaijan. You have one minute. Azerbaijan to be followed by Poland. Dear Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, at a time when global issues are becoming more complex, transboundary and interconnected, parliamentary diplomacy plays a crucial role in fostering international cooperation, facilitating dialogue and influencing foreign policy decisions. The importance of parliamentary diplomacy in shaping the state's foreign policy is growing as a result of the increased role of international organizations. Parliamentarians bring new value to the conflict resolution and dispute settlement process. Parliaments are integral for post-conflict governance and instrumental in securing successful implementation of peace agreements and long-term quality of peace. Azerbaijan could restore its sovereignty all over the country. Now Azerbaijan and Armenia are in the process of normalization of post-war relations. Signing a long-awaited peace deal between the two countries will at least bring sustainable peace to the South Caucasus. This is a very responsible and sensitive historical period when the two nations are turning off the hatred page and open up new era in the regional relationship. Unfortunately, some parliaments act in a destructive manner, issuing one-sided bias resolutions, just pouring oil to flame. Such interference is unacceptable, and those who are unable to contribute at least need to keep silence for the sake of peace, security, and welfare of these future generations. We believe that the parliamentary diplomacy gains a special role in bringing together the parliamentarians on the international platforms, enabling to build bridges for peace and security and understanding. But this year, in January, we faced at the pace Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe unforeseen motion when the credentials of the Azerbaijani parliamentary delegation was rejected just in order to meet the dirty interests of a particular group of MPs. But PACE for us is a dialogue platform enabling to strengthen the parliamentary diplomacy and people's participations in foreign policy, whom they want to punish. Nations, their mandated representatives, or ordinary citizens? Dear colleagues, this is the very question that we need to answer to save democracy and Vaya people's representations at every level of governance. Thank you for your attention. Gracias. Thank you. We will now hear from the Netherlands. Thank you, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. The subject of today's uh, discussion is parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges for peace and understanding. But how often do we ask ourselves what actually does parliamentary diplomacy mean? Is it just about going abroad, voting on resolutions, saying that there should be world peace, and then congratulating each other on a job well done. Or is it more than that? Or should it be more than that? Actual talking to each other, listening to the opinions of the others, and trying to find a common ground. Are we doing this? Are we succeeding in doing this? We had some evidence to the contrary in this very room two days ago. And while we were fighting and shouting at each other, there was one delegation profoundly enjoying it. They were enjoying it because our behavior prevented anyone from mentioning the illegal, brutal, and genocidal war they are waging in Ukraine. Should we be playing in a Russian theater? I remember when we were discussing the emergency item on Ukraine two years ago in Kigali. I appreciate how many delegations from Africa, South America, and others 
were listening and trying to understand our Central European uh, point of view. And it has worked. We have found the, f the common ground. We were able to stand firmly on the ground of our values. Let's get back to that, because this is what our voters expect us to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Armenia, you have two and a half minutes. We will now hear from Armenia. Thank you, Mr. President, Excellencies, fellow parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen. Before I start, we should condemn the terrorist attack in Moscow and extend our condolences to the victims, families, wishing speedy recovery to the injured. This is highlights. The need for unity against extremism to preserve peace and security in our states. Parliamentary diplomacy represents a powerful tool for countries to engage in global affairs, shape foreign policy, and foster peaceful international relations. Armenia remains dedicated to peace and stability in the South Caucasus region, prepared to undertake further efforts toward this goal. Constructive negotiations with Azerbaijan are ongoing, aimed to reaching a peace agreement, border delimitation, and unblocking transport communications. These efforts are guided by principles previously discussed and approved by the leaders of both countries. Number one, Armenia and Azerbaijan recognize each other's borders, territorial integrity, and the basis of 1991 Almaty Declaration. Number two, the Almaty Declaration is a political basis for the delimitation process, according to the Almaty Declaration, the newly independent former USSR republics, including Armenia and Azerbaijan, accepted that the former Soviet administrative borders between them are recognized as instate borders, interstate borders. Number three, regional communication should be unblocked with respect to the sovereignty and jurisdiction of transit countries based on the principle of equality and reciprocity. Armenia's views on this topic are assumed in the Crossroads of Peace project. The Crossroads of Peace initiative will facilitate communication between the two states, business, people, and international stakeholders. This approach is vital for fostering peace, prosperity, and trust between the two countries and in the wider region. In conclusion, I am pleased to announce that Armenia will host the 10th Global Conference of Young, young Parliamentarians in September 2024. I, am extend, I extend a warm invitation to all the young MPs to participate in this forum and experience the hospitality of Yerevan and people of Armenia. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank all the states and the countries and parliamentarians for supporting the peace process between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you. The Netherlands. The Netherlands now has the floor for a minute, 30 seconds. Thank you. You started the time already. The Netherlands is a small country. It belongs to the most densely populated in the world, and in parliament, not one political party ever has an absolute majority. As a result, in the Netherlands, we know that working together is essential. We are not only aware of cooperation, it is in the essence of our political and parliamentary work. We are a coalition country, so to say. It is in the Netherlands that created the Polder model, a method of consensus decision-making. We always look for ways to find common ground, discover common interests, and build bridges between conflicting opinions and expectations. In all cooperation, freedom is a fundamental requirement. Freedom of speech, freedom of information, freedom of religion, freedom of association, and freedom of press. Freedom of press hasn't been a main subject during this assembly. While, and I quote, in wars and armed conflicts, the first one dying is the truth, unquote. 
That is a well-known saying that also stresses the importance of free press to deliver factual information. And although the Netherlands are back again in the top 10 of countries with freedom of press, also our journalists are intimidated and threatened, especially when they are female. Please join us in stressing the importance of freedom of press. Let's work together across borders, across cultures and across parliaments to build and maintain that. I invite you to share your learnings and maybe together we can put this important issue of freedom of press on the agenda of the next assembly. Thank you. Thank you. Bolivia has the floor for one minute. Gracias. Th thank you. I would like to stress three fundamental elements of parliamentary diplomacy. First of all, democracy. Parliamentary systems means, mean more democracy, not just elections, but uh, thinking about uh, three ways of deepening democracy. You need parity, you need a gender perspective, and you need to accept a difference, community and people's democracy and unity. Here we is uh, something that we should bear in mind. The question before us is parliamentary diplomacy. We need integration, secondly. President, it is, we would like to suggest that parliamentary blocs, at least with respect to par Latin America, Mercosur, the Andean Parliament, the Central American Parliament, and the Latin American Parliament, we would suggest all be included as observers here at the IPU. And the third basic element is peace. There can be no parliamentary democracy or parliamentary diplomacy without Pete, without fighting against racism and hate speech. Parliamentary diplomacy, in fact, means that it's possible to think of a new world. Thank you, Bolivia. France has the floor for one minute, 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, yesterday the Security Council of the United Nations finally adopted a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, while stressing the need to have more aid to Gaza. This is a, an accomplishment, however, it does leave a bitter taste because those behind the resolution in the UN included some countries that did not work in favor of our adopting the emergency item here. And this is too bad because the parliaments can, can succeed in very admirable ways. For instance, we recently welcomed a meeting in Paris, including our president, uh, for a meeting to back uh, women's rights. Uh, and there is uh, a, this was an opportunity to talk about the significance of ensuring that girls are educated in order to guarantee their emancipation and their right to sexual and reproductive rights on equal terms. Uh, we need if we are to uh, make progress as humanity, we need to recognize the rights of girls and women, and we must never, ever step back from that. Uh, as uh, Simone de Beauvoir reminded us in 1949, don't forget that you, all you need is a political, economic, or religious crisis for girls' and women's rights to be called into question. These rights can never be taken for granted. You must make sure that you maintain a careful eye on this situation throughout your life. And indeed, it is true, we need to ensure, it uh, is our responsibility to ensure that girls' and women's rights are respected. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Francia. Thank you, France. Nigeria, you have one minute.
the President of the Assembly, the Secretariat, most distinguished friends and colleagues. I bring you greetings from the people and government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Today we focus on parliamentary diplomacy, building bridges and peace and understanding. Sunday's deliberation on humanitarian crisis in Gaza showed us what parliamentary democracy should not be. We failed to reach consensus, missing a crucial opportunity for collective action. True democracy requires compromise and understanding, even on contentious issues. My dear friends and colleagues, war is ugly. We must always count the cost before engaging in it. It is very expensive on human and material costs. We must consider, and this is the proposition of the delegation from Nigeria, our rule 11 sub 2, which allows for flexibility, suggesting the possibility of addressing multiple urgent issues, it should be considered again, where more than one issue could come up as emergency item on the list. Because what this has done over the years is that some continents are shortchanged, and Africa is one of them. We are crisis in Africa, 13,000 lives are lost in Sudan, and uh, other parts of Africa is not mentioned on the list. This must be reviewed. Gender equality also is an interest for the delegation from Nigeria, because we believe that their inclusion in governance as peace builders, as peacemakers that women are, that will be able to get to the destination that we are looking for in making peace and making the world a better place. 26% that is um, uh, the representation of women is it's, it's, a poor, it's a poor indication that we need to do more around the globe with regards to women participation. In addition, building bridges for this peace needs to incorporate places like uh, um, um, uh, Africa, DRC Congo, uh, Sahel in Africa, Sudan, and uh, making sure that their voices are heard. Parliamentary diplomacy offers a strategic approach to global peace. We must focus on conflicts, prevention, management, and post-conflict peace building. And this has led the National Assembly of Nigeria to look into the effort of establishing initiatives that will help in managing peace in post-war areas like the southeastern zone of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And this is called Southeast Peace Project, which has bettered the Southeast Development Commission, which when passed to law will help to calm the uh, agitations of uh, this zone that have been suffering from the post-war problems that has taken place over five decades uh, um, ago Terminé, without reintegration favor, and uh, rehabilitation. I want to thank you all for listening. Two minutes is actually too short for us to make our intervention, but I'm believing that I wish the world the peace that pass all understanding. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Let me remind you that you must stick to the time you are allotted because we have a number of speakers on the list. Japan has the floor for two and a half minutes. Japan, you have the floor. My name is Yumi. Yoshikawa, member of the House of Councillors of the National Diet of Japan, as well as deputy head of our delegation. Until last year, as a parliamentary vice minister for foreign affairs, being in charge of disarmament, non-proliferation, and international cooperation, I strongly advocated for the protection of civilians during armed conflict and for the need to comply with international law. As a parliamentarian, I am currently making every effort to serve as a bridge for peace and understanding by applying my experience in government to advocate for humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and Gaza, as well as to provide support for self-reliance and reconstruction thereafter. The House of Councillors, of which I am a member, is known as the House of Common Sense or the House of Reconsideration. We focus on parliamentary oversight of the government. In particular, as regards to development assistance by the government, we, as the parliament, are deeply involved by dispatching specialized ODA research group 
to countries overseas and question the government as regards to their initiatives. Japan actively contributes to the development of infrastructure, such as bridges through ODA and economic cooperation. Bridges physically connect countries and regions, but also play the role of closing gaps between people's hearts and minds. In our modern society, globalization has made it impossible to separate international issues from domestic ones, which is why national parliaments need to be more actively involved in international affairs. We discussed the situation in Gaza as an emergency item during this plenary. The preamble of the Constitution of Japan, which we are proud of, states that we recognize that people of the world have the right to live in peace free from fear and want. It is now time to propose, under the current situation, that this principle of the right to a peaceful existence be upheld as a basic principle of IPU, which represents all people of the world. By recognizing the right to a peaceful existence of all people of the world, we, Japanese parliamentarians, promise to actively engage in peacemaking through parliamentary diplomacy that serves as a bridge to peace and understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Peru has the floor. One minute, 30 seconds. Peru. Thank you, President. Good afternoon to all. I am uh, Paredes Gonzalez from Peru. Dialogue, uh, consensus, and uh, consultation are vital if we are to have genuine, honest parliamentary diplomacy. We have a number of different conflicts and war in different parts of the world. We are in a position to give an example of parliamentary diplomacy by showing that we can reach understand an understanding that goes beyond differences of view. We can work for life, solidarity, humanity, peace, and against hunger. We are always acutely aware of the fact that we can do more. And let us hope that at, the next, at our next opportunity to meet, we will take advantage of the opportunity to reach agreement through votes. So I think that if we have done, we could have taken the example that we have from our own parliaments and realized that we can get things done Sometimes we have to bear in mind that uh, be doing good is the easiest way of being happy. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Ireland, Iceland, you have the floor for one minute. Don't know. The global, the global community must not remain silent as an entire nation forces faces annihilation before our very eyes. What is happening in Gaza is the greatest human rights violation of our time. We cannot say we didn't hear, we cannot say we didn't see, and we cannot say we didn't know. One day our children and our grandchildren will look to us and ask, how was this allowed to happen? And why so many leaders in the West got it so badly wrong? The people of Gaza face horrifying levels of hunger and imminent famine. Famine resonates deeply with Ireland. We are only a few generations away from famine when over one million Irish people starve to death. Over one million people, half of Gaza's population, are at grave risk. Having endured 165 days of genocide, slaughter, displacement and dispossession, 
The people of Gaza now face disastrous famine and disease. Israel is using starvation as a weapon of war. As the spectrum of famine stalks Gaza, Israel continues its relentless bombardment. In Ireland, we know conflict, but we also know the value of hard-won peace. The Good Friday Agreement shows that no conflict is intractable. Leaders across the West must join from across the world and push unequivocally for the immediate, full and permanent ceasefire. Ireland was the first country in Europe to categorically state without equivocation that Israel had carried out the crime of annexation in the occupied territories. We need to enact the Unoccupied Territories Bill and the Israeli Settlements Divestment Bill. We must stop the war. We must have a ceasefire. Ireland stands with Palestine Ireland stands for peace. Thank you very much. Montenegro, you have one and a half minutes. Distinguished chairperson, estimated colleagues, growing up in a country butchered by the war leaves horrible scars on human soul, lives, and according to science, in our brain also. Today, by we are sit sitting here, more than 600 million women and children are trying to survive within the war areas. From the perspective of citizens, there is no benefits from war, no matter who is the winner. We who grew up in former Yugoslavia, we know this from the first hand. To the children in war zones, names of our countries that we all have in front of us sound like names of some divine creatures with superpowers that can stop the war. Even though countries are not characters from fairy tales, but the projects of decision makers, us, like those children, I believe that we can do good things and stop the conflict. Our magic stick is the dialogue. Parliamentary diplomacy is an effective measure in conflict management. We, as the parliamentarians, should be a voice of gathering, promotion of understanding, calling on ceasefire and finding resolution. We should talk openly and loudly how violence affects everyday people's life, years and years after the conflict is over. And we should use this global platform to build bridges among us and spread the empathy for all people in wars. Our conclusions are not binding for the governments, but if we all talk in one voice, we have a chance to make a pressure. Nowadays, lives and future of people are sculpturing by traumatic experiences in war zones. Some of those people are or will become our family members, neighbors, friends, our love. And this current conflict are, or they will be, the reason of our personal suffering, because the refugee issue is everybody's issue. Dear colleagues from all around the world, we must confirm, uh, confront the evil and stop the circle of violence in the international area. Dear friends, let's do our best to spread the message of peace and understanding and dialogue because the kids in war areas believe in our countries, they believe in us, and we can't let them down. Thank you. Thank you. Singapore has the floor for one and a half minutes. Mr. President, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Joan Pereira and I'm a member of Parliament of Singapore. In our current Parliament, 30% of our parliamentarians are women across the different political parties and nominated members of Parliament. As female parliamentarians, we play an important role in understanding and continuing to articulate the needs and aspirations of women in Singapore and ensuring that our laws and policies evolve to support and empower them. The United Nations Human Development Reports ranked Singapore 8th out of 166 countries 
for having one of the lowest gender inequality index values in 2022. We are proud of this ranking as a testament to our women's progress and achievements in areas such as educational attainment, employment, empowerment and health. However, we cannot rest on our laurels. Our parliament regularly and frequently reviews and debates on areas for improvement. In early 2022, our parliament debated on and endorsed the White Paper on Singapore Women's Development. The White Paper included 25 action plans in five key areas, equal opportunities in the workplace, recognition and support for caregivers, protection against violence and harm, other support measures for women and mindset shifts. Another example would be the workplace fairness legislation stated for passage in Parliament in the second half of this year. This legislation will strengthen fair practices at workplaces, including the prohibition of specified forms of discrimination based on gender, marital and pregnancy status. The Parliament of Singapore is committed to the advancement of women as integral and equal members of our society on the principle of meritocracy. We look forward to learning from and sharing with fellow parliamentarians globally as the world moves forward in achieving our commitments to the UN Sustainable Development Goals to create a fairer world for all. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much indeed. And let's move to D, young parliamentarians. And let's begin with Nigeria. And every speaker will have two minutes in this section. Good afternoon, this um, assembly. As a young parliamentarian, I stand before you today as a representative of the young voices in our global parliamentary community, voices that are eager to be heard and to make a meaningful impact on the world we are inheriting. Our generation brings to the table the energy of youth and the audacity to imagine a world that is not yet realized. And we are not naive to the historical and political precedents set by those who have come before us, as these precedents serve as both a guidepost and a challenge. They remind us of the progress achieved through dialogue and cooperation, and yet underscore the vast terrain we still must traverse. To build bridges, we must first recognize that every nation has its own history, its own struggles, and its own aspirations. Understanding these narratives is the first step towards empathy, and empathy is the cornerstone of peace. We must make use of every tool at our disposal to keep the channels of communication open. I have first-hand knowledge of the difficulties and sacrifices associated with achieving peace through dialogue. As chairman of the Senate committee, we oversight responsibilities over the Niger Delta Development Commission, the largest interventionist agency in Nigeria. My members and I are burdened with task of building bridges for peace and development in the Niger Delta region, a region globally renowned for its rich cultural heritage and abundant natural endowment, but also unfortunately known for its long history of conflict and unrest primarily driven by the oil reserves that lie beneath its surface. Parliamentary diplomacy stands as a cornerstone in fostering cooperation, dialogue, and mutual understanding among nations and regions, providing a unique platform for engaging in constructive dialogue, promoting peace, and resolving conflicts through diplomatic means. I urge the Interparliamentary Union to enact resolutions that do not merely seek of peace, but actively construct its architecture. Resolutions that recognize the suffering of women and children who are victims of war and violence. Resolutions that recognize the importance of youth engagement in political processes, ensuring that our voices are not only heard, but heeded. In the words of the late Kofi Annan, peace is never a perfect achievement. It requires the commitment of each one of us to the ideals of understanding, tolerance, and shared prosperity. As we deliberate on the issues before us, let us be reminded that peace is not just a destination, but a manner of traveling. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. And let's move on with these young parliamentarians and give the floor to the United Kingdom. Mr. President, honorable young parliamentarians, I'm pleased to be able to inform this distinguished assembly of the lesson 
that I will take away from this conference. It is that there is a new generation of young leaders emerging around the world who are championing freedom, supporting the rule of law, and advancing democracy, who are determined to fight hatred and division, and who together will lead a new project to rebuild and reinvigorate the rules-based order for a new global era. Our heroes are the young parliamentarians of Ukraine. They are standing against the illegal war being waged upon them. Our heroes are the young female politicians around the world fighting for equal representation in their societies. And our heroes are the brave parliamentarians resisting oppression and tyranny, even by making the ultimate sacrifice and laying down their lives. So I have some bad news for the colleagues who in this hall have been organizing the dirty work of repressive regimes. You must know that all tyrannies will end. All dictatorships will expire. Every authoritarianism is eventually crushed by the irrepressible human desire for freedom, and there is nothing you will be able to do to stop it. So that is why I invite every distinguished delegate from every country today to join a new democratic generation, reject the false promises of authoritarianism, because authoritarians are yesterday's men. They hate youth, they detest the vibrancy and promise of free young people, and we, the young parliamentarians of the world, will stand against them and build a free world. Slava Ukraini, thank you. Thank you. Singapore has the floor. Mr. President, fellow parliamentarians, my name is Louis Chua and I'm a member of Parliament of Singapore. Thank you for giving young MPs like myself the opportunity to address the General Assembly. As legislators, members of Parliament in Singapore or any parliaments around the world play a critical role in promoting peace, stability and the overall well-being of our nations. Through scrutinising draft laws and taking up a critical and inquisitorial role in Parliament, parliamentarians empower and give a voice to our citizens, ensuring that there will always be a healthy national dialogue on issues that matter to our people. Internationally, the IPU was founded on the notion that dialogue is central to the peaceful resolution of conflict. Recognising these over the years, parliamentarians from Singapore have worked hard to contribute to peace and better understanding by establishing regional parliamentary groups, engaging in regular parliamentary dialogue and participating at interparliamentary conferences, forums and general assemblies. Members of parliament in Singapore are organised into seven regional parliamentary groups. Members volunteer and indicate their interest to join such RPGs. RPG members host incoming visits to Parliament House and from their counterparts in countries and jurisdictions around the world. The RPGs provide a fora for members to forge closer and more regular relations with parliamentarians from each respective region. Members also regularly attend inter-parliamentary conferences and meetings organised by multilateral institutions such as the ASEAN Inter-Parliamentary inter Assembly, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, the Asia-Pacific Parliamentary Forum and the Inter-Parliamentary Union. Such platforms provide the opportunity for members to have dialogues to promote deeper understanding and to forge warm ties among parliamentarians of various jurisdictions and ultimately to bring all our nations closer together amid these difficult times. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And let's go back to B, because for five minutes, we have the representative of Switzerland to speak. Merci, Monsieur le Président de C Thank you, Chair. Um, dear 
parliamentarians, young parliamentarians. I have the pleasure on behalf of the Swiss delegation to join this inter-parliamentary assembly and uh, discuss this very important theme of parliamentary diplomacy. And what a pleasure here in Geneva, international Geneva, where for many years the Swiss parliament uh, supports the uh, activities here uh, of many international organizations uh, and indeed non-governmental organizations as well. As parliamentarians, we're convinced of the um, complementary nature of these different activities. Obviously, uh, the government is responsible for um, the executive uh, branch and international relations, but the parliament also has an important responsibility, and let's not forget that, colleagues. Parliaments uh, adopt budgets, which uh, give governments the means to take action. It also reaches agreements. Uh, parliaments uh, vote on different steps to be taken. And through their political uh, foreign uh, affairs committees, uh, the parliament guides the government uh, and helps it to understand what the different political groups think about uh, foreign policy. Um, from the very conception of those policies to implementation. So obviously there are complementarities, uh, there are links. Uh, of course, there are also links between uh, state and uh, non-governmental bodies. And we see this in many different countries where very often you need to strengthen uh, those links because some UN or state or non-governmental agencies uh, may be best placed to achieve specific objectives. So it's important that as parliamentarians we ensure that there is good co coordination uh, and, and that these different actors are working in complementary fashion. We've talked a lot about parliamentary diplomacy. It's also something very important for the IPU to be involved in, either through the um, Committee on Middle East uh, Questions or from the Cyprus Facilitators uh, uh, Task Force. Those are key uh, examples where parliamentary diplomacy uh, has played an important role in supporting other intergovernmental or governmental processes. And it's very important for parliaments to be involved in that too. IPU, the IPU exists for longer than the United Nations, and the uh, Parliamentary Assembly of the Francophonie is also a key player and uh, works as a partner to intergovernmental organizations. So, dear colleagues, we have a responsibility, and we've given our commitment to that. Uh, uh, and it's important for foreign policy of our countries and for international cooperation. Once again, the IPU is a wonderful example, and it really is worth supporting it and continuing to work within it uh, with our networks uh, and whatever we can do. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. So let's go back to the section on the young parliamentarians and give the floor to Morocco. Thank you, Mr. President. Given that parliamentarians play an essential role and a critical role in building peace and understanding, allow me, as a member of the Moroccan delegation, to participate in this fruitful discussion by proposing a series of suggestions and recommendations. First, uh, parliamentary groups and entities should uh, consecrate uh, the basic rights, uh, human rights, and respect for uh, freedoms through uh, parliamentary diplomacy. We need to work as honest mediators in the efforts aimed at spreading peace, security, and understanding. This will help us achieve respect for international humanitarian law and uh, human rights in a way that uh, uh, in a way to achieve human rights and dignity we need also to use all the diplomatic tools available to us through the various mechanisms in order to resolve conflicts by working with various entities and stakeholders 
We also need to establish national dialogues in order to achieve reconciliation and establish peace and security. Parliamentarians should uh, ensure complementarity and should adopt a comprehensive approach that is in line with the policies of their governments and uh, the national diplomacy. Parliamentary diplomacy uh, includes uh, various activities such as organizing missions and delegations. This can help ensure respect for human rights and respect for uh, multilater multilateralism. With regards to the IPU, it, this organization is called upon to continue working on establishing peace. It should be able to intervene in areas of conflict. I am a member of the Forum of Young Par Parliamentarians, and therefore I call on the IPU to allow this forum, as well as the Forum for Women Parliamentarians, to participate better and contribute more efficiently in the activities of the IPU. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Morocco. Italy has the floor. Chairman, Mr. President, honorable colleagues, I'm here in uh, Geneva for the first time. Here with you, dear colleagues, here at the IPU and here on uh, this stage. It is an honor for me to be able to debate in a, an organization whose slogan is uh, for democracy for everyone. The truth, however, is uh, quite different. Democracy is uh, still a distance mirage, and uh, too many people in this world do not live by the basic rules of law. I have listened to many speeches over the last uh, few days, and they all seem to be going in the same direction, in the search of balance, stability, and conflict resolution. However, we are living through a moment of extreme geopolitical tension, a moment characterized by constant conflict and clash. But time is passing, and all of us who have the honor of representing a million of people need answer, courage, and brave for a change of peace. There are epoch epochal challenges that, uh, that can no longer be postponed and every opportunity can be crucial to improve things. We need to think about this could be too late. Thank you. Thank you very much. Azerbaijan has the floor. Dear Mr. Chairman, dear Assembly delegates, Mutual respect and equality of all states, large and small, is the most important principle of the United Nations Charter. Harassment and aggression against sovereign states from a position of strength is totally unacceptable. We must actively develop and realize true multilateralism, promote equality of all countries in rights and opportunities, and make efforts to form a new type of international relations based on respect justice, and mutually beneficial cooperation. In this regard, my attention has been drawn to a part of the concept note to the general debates, which states, I quote, unilateral measures taken by states against other states without prior authorization by the international community continue to undermine global security, stability, and people's livelihoods, as well as the credibility of multilateral institutions. In my understanding, in order to obtain prior authorization for unilateral measures, it's first of all necessary to ensure trust in international organizations that promote peace and security, strengthen their authority in the world community, and ensure the full supremacy of the international law. Unfortunately, there are many cases where legally binding documents adopted by international organizations are completely ignored by many states for years confirming the fact that these organizations are simply powerless in solving global problems and preventing conflicts. 
Today, many international organizations have simply turned into an instrument of powerful states and become hostages of their state interests. What kind of prior authorization can we talk about in such circumstances? In order to achieve peace and security in the world, the entire system of international organizations must first be reformed. By and large, global security and stability continue to be undermined, not by states, but by international organizations that remain silent and do not act effectively and efficiently. In this regard, we welcome the motion of the Standing Committee on UN Affairs on the need to reform the UN Security Council. As a young parliamentarians, we must advocate, encourage, promote, and take all possible measures to ensure the supremacy of international law, protect and empower the international organizations to have a real impact and influence on states that fragrantly float and ignore international law, its norms and principles. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. Mexico has the floor. Thank you, Chair, and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Organized crime and the crisis of multilateralism are two themes that have been addressed in different fora at this assembly, and they are issues which are closely linked to parliamentary diplomacy. Organized crime is a challenge to uh, democratic governance and development um, in countries and regions in a country, Mexico, and in the whole of the Latin American region. Because of its very nature, organized crime is international and tries to develop as an alternative system operating outside of the rule of law. And in that context, it's a vital priority to resolve the crisis in multilateralism as a system uh, at regional and global levels to protect us from these issues, from problems that go beyond uh, national borders. And that's why we must recognize the weakness of the current uh, international architecture to try to enact a paradigm change uh, in uh, global organizations. Global organizations need to be effective and more efficient in resolving global problems because uh, that will give them greater legitimacy. Thank you. Thank you. Denmark has the floor next. Okay, thank you. Anybody can say that they want a peaceful world, but it takes a lot of hard work and a lot of dedication to actually get a peaceful world. Action speaks louder than words. And when it comes to the Russian Federation under the Putin regime, action has spoken so loud. It did not have to be this way. No one forced Russia to invade a neighboring country, a country guilty of nothing except of wishing to become a true part of the free and open world as if Russia had to invade Ukraine, as if Russia had to be an enemy of the free world. The free world is an open club. Russia, why do you want the world to fear you? And why do you want to fear the world? You have so much to offer the world, and the world has so much to offer you. Ukrainians have be become heroes of the free world for the brave fight against Russia. They have demonstrated that the bonds between free people always will be stronger than the fear from a regime like Russia. A coalition with 10 times the power of Russia, military as well as financially, has sworn to continue to support for Ukraine. Russia, you will never win the war you have started. You will be weaker from it, not stronger. But it's never too late to turn around. No one in the West dreams of a world without Russia. But that will be the final destination of the road that Russia have taken, and is still going down. A nation of great culture and history will be lost to the world and to themselves. We all say we wish for a peaceful world, and now it's time to prove it. Russia, stop the war. Thank you. Thank you, Denmark. I now give the floor to the Bahamas. The Bahamas have the floor.
parliamentarians, distinguished colleagues. There is a permeating unease engulfing the world right now. Off the heels of a global pandemic that brought the world to its knees, we are seeing a rise in tensions and conflict across the globe, from the Russian aggression in Ukraine to the brutality in the Middle East. And at the heart of this is a test and one defining question. Will the international community come together to reject the cancer of conflict? With 56 countries experiencing armed conflict in 2023, the IPU provides a needed space for parliamentary dialogue and diplomacy at a global level. I'm from the Caribbean, a region known for its beauty, its peace, and its stability. But even now, we are dealing with the growing instability and conflict in Haiti and grappling with the ex existential threat to Guyana's territorial integrity. The situation in Haiti is particularly dire. If Haiti isn't yet formally deemed a failed state, it is well on its way. Government institutions and basic services have broken down and gang violence has sparked one of the worst humanitarian crises the world has ever seen. We in the Bahamas are now on the front lines of this crisis, becoming home to over 80,000 Haitian refugees. The problems that Haiti faces are decades in the making, some say even centuries, and right now, we need the world's help in the Caribbean. Fellow parliamentarians, even in the midst of contrary views of the opposition at home, the government of the Bahamas is steadfast in our foreign policy of active engagement, making friends, allies, and partners around the world. We know that it is through only through cooperation, friendship, and multilateralism can the world realize true peace, stability, and prosperity. So as we say in the islands, Godspeed, we wish you peace, prosperity, and stability. Thank you. Thank you, Bahamas. We will now continue with Algeria. You have the floor. In the name of God, the compassionate and the merciful, I bring you greetings to you from a young parliamentarian who's working for peace from Algeria. Our motto is that we must all be brothers. We are all brothers. That is the way to peace. I find myself today with my colleagues at an inter-parliamentary assembly where we are working for young people in order to ensure that we have changed and lay the foundations for a much more stable, serene, and peaceful world. Unfortunately, we see that uh, parliamentary diplomacy has failed with respect to the protection of peoples. And we do find that we're hearing voices that are against uh, humanism. We uh, find ourselves uh, still hearing people reading from the colonial book. This means that we have to deal with uh, a climate where politics uh, seems to just justify the powerful and ignore the victims. This is what we see in the Gaza Strip now. What we see is genocide. What I would like to say is that Algeria has always fought and will continue to do so to defend all just causes. And we certainly defend the principle of the non-interference in the domestic affairs of other states. And I would like to 
refer to what was said by the representative of Morocco with respect to the Sahrawi people. This is a situation we have uh, known about for some time now. The Western Sahara situation is a matter that is under consideration by the International Court of Justice. We welcome the decision, take the resolution adopted by the Security Council with respect to Gaza. Thank you. Thank you. Mexico has the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Peace is the result of uh, justice. That is what uh, the President of Mexico has had to say. And this is a matter of concern to us this afternoon. We are talking about the parliamentary diplomacy in the interest of peace and understanding. If we are to really have peace, we first of all need to ensure that those who have been marginalized by history obtain justice, because without justice, we cannot move forward. We need, for instance, to encourage the active participation of women in political life and decision-making. My country currently in the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate has the same has gender parity and they have women speakers and indeed the chair of the Chamber of Deputies is here with us at this 148th interparliamentary assembly on the 2nd of June we're going to have elections in Mexico and they are probably going to have a woman president of Mexico, a humanist who is indeed a progressive. In Morelos, we have a woman governor, Margarita Gonzalez Arabia, and I welcome her from here. And I'm very proud that she is the governor of my state where I was born. Now, here we have uh, a significant participation of women. And we in Mexico are doing what we can to ensure that women are more and more involved in decision taking. And this is an ambition of ours, not just for Mexico, but for the world. Promoting peace through parliamentary uh, diplomacy will uh, ensure that we will have a role to play and there will be gender parity throughout society. We feel that uh, we have a responsibility, and that is to ensure that uh, men and women uh, working together in public life, uh, that is significant for in the interest of representation and institutional viability. It also can help us ensure that we have peaceful, resilient societies. That is the only way that we will have fair, empathetic societies that will therefore enjoy peace. Thank you for your attention. Muchas gracias. Thank you. And we will finish this round of young parliamentarians by giving the floor to Malta. Thank you. Today is the International Day for People with Epilepsy. And this week in Geneva, I met Sarita, a young human rights champion who also suffers from epilepsy. I was asked by her father to give her some advice for the future. And I told her, when you're discussing an issue, no matter how strong your argument is, no matter how passionate you are, take a step back. Put yourself in that other person's shoes for a second and try to understand the opposing argument. And this, dear colleagues, is the same adv advice I have been repeating in meetings all week. We have failed again 
because we didn't listen to the other side enough. I was shocked to hear people saying that it's better not to discuss the Gaza issue than discussing it and having a result which they don't like. Shame. Well, you know, that, you know what? All of us here will go back home tomorrow to embrace our families. But those people whose families are being held hostage cannot embrace them. And those civilians in Gaza cannot go back home because they don't have a home anymore and cannot embrace their loved ones because they are dead. Why? Because we are allowing hate to win over love and hope. And while we were here this week, in other parts of the world, hate continued to spread. Just yesterday, the Parliament of Georgia started debating a bill to ban gender affirmation for trans people, to ban adoption for same-sex couples, and even to ban LGBTIQ plus people from gathering in the streets. You know what? To our siblings in Tbilisi, we are with you. And just a few days ago, while we were in this chamber, the Russian government added the LGBTIQ plus organizations to the list of extremists and terrorists. Am I a terrorist? For what? For being true to myself? And what is my weapon? Is it the spread of love? Is it this band? Is this my weapon? Well, you know what? If wearing this band makes me a terrorist, then so be it. I will never surrender. And I wear this band for those who cannot wear it, so that they know that they have a safe space with me. And on this note, allow me to appeal to the Secretary General, whom I have the utmost respect. Please, Mr. Zhu Gong, on behalf of all the LGBTIQ+, members of IPU, please ensure the safety and protection of all LGBTIQ plus members of the IPU who will be attending the 150th assembly next year. There has been reports of physical violence, including by the police, extortion and imprisonment of LGBTIQ plus people. No one should be imprisoned or face abuse for being who they are. No one should be forced to hide one's identity, including members of parliament, during the course of their duties. And while I met it, I reiterate a call I had already made to the president of the IPU for the establishment of a forum of LGBTIQ plus members of parliament here in IPU, in the spirit of our motto, for democracy, for everyone. Because, dear colleagues, it's not gay people who should fight for gay rights. It's not Palestinians who should fight for freedom. It's not Ukrainians who should defend their territory. It's for all of us to defend what is right and condemn what is wrong. It's for all of us to defend human rights. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, our member of XCOM from Spain, for the good work that you have done and for sharing this session. So you have, cha you have shared the co-presidency with me. So I really appreciate uh, all, all that you have done. But also all colleagues who chaired uh, with him this morning, thank you so much for having done a very good job. So we appreciate you. Thank you so much for the good job. Please, a round of applause. Okay. Colleagues, we have um, two uh, more speakers, but these are uh, special, special guests to us. We have um, Dr. Philip Pollier, 
who is the United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs. As many of you know, in 2023, the United Nations established a youth office to lead the engagement and advocacy for the advancement of youth issues across the United Nations. This new office, which replaced the previous office of the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth, has also served to promote the inclusive and effective engagement of youth and youth-led organizations in the United Nations. The United Nations Youth Office and the Envoy's Office before it have been close partners of IPU for years, especially with the Forum of Young Parliamentarians. I am very pleased to introduce to you today the leader of this new office, Dr. Philippe Paulier of Uruguay. Dr. Paulier is the first Assistant Secretary General for Youth Affairs of the United Nations. We are very grateful that he has been able to join us in Geneva this time. Uh, he also attended the Forum of Young Parliamentarians on Sunday and also attended the Standing Committee for United Nations uh, earlier today. Youth are among the first victims of radicalization and conflict. Their participation in prevention and resolution of disputes is therefore essential for building a sustainable peace. In 2015, the United Nations adopted the Security Council Resolution number 2250 on youth, peace, and security. And we are happy to hear from Dr. Poulier on how parliamentarians can help uh, implement this important resolution for a more peaceful world. And now I would welcome Dr. Poulier to the podium to address the assembly. Dr. Poulier, you have the floor. Honorable members of the parliamentary community from all over the world, thank you for allowing me to be at this forum. Let me thank especially Madam President of IPU and Mr. Secretary General of IPU for inviting me to be part of the 148 IPU's assembly. And especially, let me thank you to the chair of the Youth Parliamentarians Forum MP Dan Cardon for the personal invitation also to join here. In a current world facing more conflicts than in any time since World War II, in a world that is witnessing the accelerated degradation of the planet due to human actions and experiencing democratic backsliding, the future ahead, especially for the future generation, is certainly alarming. 90% of the young people live in developing countries and often face negative stereotypes that they are the ones that keep perpetrating the idea of violence, which provokes a so-called policy panic. However, let me say it loud and clear Young people embody a, a beacon of hope in the promise of peace. Despite the financial, legal, cultural, and social barriers faced by young people, they persist and take active roles as space builders, as activists, as human rights defenders, as innovators, and as leaders of numerous social movements. The United Nations Security Council resolutions on youth peace and security have been groundbreaking in recognizing the positive role that young people play in fostering peace and preventing violence. These international frameworks need to guide all of us in working with young people as partners and not as passive observers on working with young people as creators of initiatives and not just recipients of services. It is essential that we put these frameworks to good use together with young people to ensure that youth 
are systematically included in the decision-making process at all levels, especially in peace-building efforts. But, unfortunately, this is not yet a reality. As we have heard during these days, although that more than half of the world's population is under 30 years old, only 2.8% of members of parliaments are under 30, and less than 1% of members of parliaments are young women. Young women, specifically, face structural barriers due to their age and gender, pushing them even further from gaining access to public office. When additionally factors such as race, sexual orientation, and disability are considered, new gaps arise. Younger generations are still largely absent from decision-making, despite younger generations are the one most impacted by the current political decisions or by the lack of political decisions. Young people who want to take part face multiple cultural, structural, financial, and leg legislative barriers in exercising their political rights. Many are disappointed and mistrust political institutions since their actions aren't recognized and their priorities are not reflected. We need political spaces and systems that actively shake up the traditional norms and modernize its institutions to channel youth political engagement to places where decisions are made and where peace agreements are negotiated. Dear parliamentarians, we urgently require youth inclusion in decision-making processes if we want to restore faith in institutions. Only peace-building efforts that are inclusive of young people in all their diversity will be sustainable. This is not only a matter of youth representation in politics. It is a cross-sectorial and human rights issue. Young people in all their diversity have the right to participate. And let me say something more. Having spaces for youth engagement is a smart decision for institutions. To meaningfully increase the representation of young people in public life and politics, more disaggregated data is necessary to inform the current status of the world on youth engagement in policy and decision-making processes, including peace processes. I call for your support to develop strong and reliable data to create frameworks to inform policies that ensure youth political participation by removing the existing barriers to their meaningful and safe engagement is more accountable. Dear parliamentarians, at the Forum of Young Parliamentarians yesterday, I shared some concrete ways that as elected officials and members of parliaments, you can take action to advance on youth political participation for peace building. Allow me to repeat it here today because this is a shared responsibility. This is an intergenerational commitment. First, you can lead or support the youth peace and security agenda within parliamentary commissions, including accountability systems to monitor its implementation at the country level. Second, you can support the creation of youth bodies in parliament including establishing mechanisms to ensure systematic consultations of young people in parliamentary deliberations. Third, you can advocate for the adoption of national action plans, national roadmaps, national frameworks, or even the establishment of national coalitions on youth peace and security that include specific budget allocation. Finally, you can promote and support IPU's campaign, I Say Yes to Youth in Parliaments. Dear parliamentarians, while we open spaces for young people to be part as equal partners of policy making and decision making processes, we must recognize the interconnected factors 
shaping young people's response vulnerabilities, including their gender, their sexual orientation, their race, ethnicity, and disability. For that, the participation of young people needs to be fully accessible and safe. Only peace-building efforts that are inclusive of young people will be sustainable. Allow me to end by prompting you a question for discussion. If meaningful youth engagement is an imperative to build bridges for peace, which strategies and concrete actions are you taking in your parliaments to ensure this prerequisite is met? The change is intergenerational or it won't be. So we count on you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Polier, for those views, which are very important to us as members of parliament. And I'm sure we will all be taking those on board as we try to make a difference, but also contribute to the agenda that is before us as we strengthen our relationship with our youths in parliament, but also the youth globally. I would now welcome Mr. Ben Majekoduni, uh, the Chief of Staff um, of UNRWA. It's coming right now. Yes. yes. Um, dear colleagues, for many years, the Interparliamentary Union and the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, UNRWA, have had a strong partnership. UNRWA's active role in our assemblies and its contribution to the discussions of the IPU Committee on the Middle East Questions have been instrumental in advancing our understanding of the grave humanitarian crisis in Palestine and have been key in forming our approach to some of the issues at hand. The IPU remains committed to UNRWA's mission to provide relief and human development for all Palestinian refugees. We recognize the essential services of UNRWA, uh, which it provides to millions of people from education to healthcare to emergency assistance. These efforts go beyond politics and should be rooted in a shared belief in every individual's intrinsic human rights, dignity, and worth, regardless of nationality, ethnicity, and creed. Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Ben Majekodumni, who is the Chief of Staff on UNRWA, who is here on behalf of Felipe Lazzarini. And now you have the floor to address the Assembly. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you very much, Secretary General of the IPU. Um, thank you also to the members of parliament who are present for, for inviting UNRWA to speak. Um, I have some rough notes, but I'm not speaking from a speech. This isn't really a moment for a speech. This is one of the oldest multilateral bodies in the world. It's quite incredible um, that the concept of the IPU exists. And this is a very appropriate moment to come to such a body because we are at a moment of incredible urgency and that requires an incredible standard, the highest standard of multilateralism. First, a few points on UNRWA. The international community has failed for 75 years to provide a political solution to the conflict in the Middle East. It has failed to provide a political solution that would do right by Palestinians, by Israelis, by the region, to fill the political vacuum, the General Assembly tasked UNRWA to provide services to Palestinians, to provide education, to provide healthcare, to provide social services, to provide other kinds of support. And in doing so, we are mandated to support the human rights of Palestinians, but also to bring, to bring a measure of stability to the region, and therefore a measure of stability and security for Israelis and for the wider region. UNRWA has been doing this for 75 years, even as the prospects for peace have got further and further away. And in the most recent years, the last 10 to 15 years, the, the vacuum 
the political vacuum in which we have operated has become harder and harder. The operational context has become harder. The security environment has become harder. It has become more and more dangerous for the organization to, to operate, and yet we have continued. On the 7th of October, my second point, we saw horrendous attacks on civilians in Israel, the horrendous killing of civilians in Israel. We learned most recently from the Secretary General's special representative on sexual violence and conflict that, in, that as well as those killings, there were also likely to have been serious acts of sexual violence. We saw these horrendous acts on the 7th of October. We saw hostages taken and the abuses have continued. And since the 7th of October, we have witnessed what can only be described at, as catastrophic killing and suffering in Gaza. There are, as we understand it, almost 32,000 people who have been killed, the very large majority civilians. There are 13,000 children, 13,000 children reported dead in Gaza in the last six months, while we have been overseeing the multilateral system. We have witnessed 13,000 children being killed. In Gaza, we have seen primary schools, secondary schools, places of tertiary education, places of worship, places of celebration, places of mourning, places of employment, cemeteries, roads, places that produce electricity, that produce and manage water, that produce and manage sewage, homes, all destroyed, also under our watch. I was in Gaza most recently, about six weeks ago. The situation in the south of Gaza is one of indescribable tension. There are people everywhere. There are children absolutely everywhere. Moving from A to B, which might be a one or two kilometer drive, which is a long way in the tiny space that is Gaza. Moving from A to B requires going first to N or M because you have to go around the places of ground fighting. You have to go around places where uh, missiles are being, are being dropped. The most frightened people that I met in Gaza, by my perception, um, were not children, surprisingly. Children can be found playing in the streets, even while you can hear machine gun fire in the background and see missile smoke rising. Their resilience enables them to play. The most frightened people are their parents who stare at their children and wonder how they can provide for them, how they can keep them safe. What will their future be in Gaza, even if the fighting were to stop tomorrow? Where will they go to school? Where will they have their birthdays? What will they eat? Where will they live? What jobs can they aspire to? How do they keep them away from militancy? Gaza is a horrible place. If you drive along the border from Rafa to the water, it's a very short border, you'll see people digging in the earth with their hands, trying to find roots from trees that have long since been cut down to be burnt. They're searching for roots that they can then also burn or they can sell or in some cases eat. It is an awful, awful place. And it is an awful place within walking distance, within sight almost, of running water, running electricity, of hospitals, of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of truckloads of food. More than any conflict, every conflict is to some extent a political conflict. More than any conflict, this is a political conflict. And the humanitarian crisis is a fundamentally political humanitarian crisis. My third point, within this situation, UNRWA, which has 13,000 staff in Gaza because of our normal uh, service delivery, our normal running of schools and healthcare, um, UNRWA is serving as the platform of just about every aspect of humanitarian, assist of humanitarian assistance, from facilitating the movement of trucks to the distribution of food to helping uh, the Bank of Palestine move cash um, from the north to the south so that the economy can still keep functioning because the economy is essential to the humanitarian survival. UNRWA has been recognized by the regional groups of member states at the General Assembly, at the Security Council, 
as being a vital lifeline for humanitarian action in Gaza. It is also being recognized as an essential uh, piece of the political solution going forward and of the equation for peace in this region. Member states have recalled time and time again that UNRWA's role has been vital to the stability of the region for Palestinians and for Israelis and for the wider region. And UNRWA is essential in another way that is difficult to define, that is not quantifiable. But when one talks to Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, Palestinians who have nothing, they will say, at least there is still UNRWA. While UNRWA continues to exist, I have some hope that we have not been forgotten, that there may be a future at the end of this hell. I make these points because UNRWA's role is not assured. We are mandated by the General Assembly, but we are being undermined. The conditions in which we operate are such uh, that we are being, uh, we've seen our funding withdrawn. We have seen uh, levels of political support withdrawn because of the inevitable consequences of working in the difficult environment that we have been tasked to work in. I would conclude my comments by saying that the situation in Gaza is perhaps most preeminent, most perfect as an example of a situation that requires, that desperately requires a multilateral solution. It requires a solution that is based on human rights, that is based on international law, that it is based on political consensus. It requires that solution now. That solution is required for Palestinians, it's required for Israelis, it's, it's required for the region. And that solution is not forthcoming. We don't see it on the horizon. And so this appeal to you is to ask you all, upon your return home, with your influence, with your commitment to multilateralism, to your interest in these issues, to please take these thoughts home to ask and inspire your parliaments and your governments to bring their energy, to bring their political weight, to resolve a humanitarian catastrophe that is also a political catastrophe, that is also a peace and security catastrophe that will only get worse, not only for Palestinians, but for the wider region. The situation desperately needs your help. Thank you. Um. Thank you so much, uh, Ben. Thank you. Do we, Dr. Felipe? Where is Dr. Felipe? Please come up because I'm going to open the uh, the discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, members. We because of time, we will only allow three uh, interventions for, and then they will respond if you have any. Who would like to take the floor? Uh, Morocco, is that Morocco? Yes. Morocco. And uh, who else? Morocco. I mean, I'm India? Here. Morocco. India. India and Iraq. Iraq. Okay. Okay, so we will begin with, uh, we will take all your interventions and then they will respond Together, I've seen Iraq already. Oh, I'm sorry, we already have three. We already have three. So Morocco, India, then Iraq. Morocco, you have the floor. Shukran Sidala Isa. Thank you, President. Well, um, we, under the Constitution of the IPU, wish to express my right uh, to reply uh, to the Algerian representative uh, who uh, said what he always says uh, about uh, Western Sahara. And uh, he spread false rumors. Uh, Hold on. I am um, sorry. I think uh, it might have been that Algeria took the floor and you would like your right of reply. Please bear with me. Let's have, a, let's have a, this discussion first, and then we will give you your right to reply. Okay, Morocco? 
So we will add one more country that was raising. Now, uh, Iraq, you're already there. Who is next to you? Iran and Lebanon, but then let's go to India. India, you have the floor. Two minutes. Honorable Chairperson and distinguished delegates, as a proud member of the IPU, India stands committed to upholding the values of transparency and accountability. For the third consecutive year, India is pleased to participate in IPU Assembly's general debate, particularly in this special accountability segment. This segment provides a valuable platform sorry, sorry, for exchanging India, good practices. India, sorry. India, sorry. I'll give you a chance when we reach that special segment. Right yeah. now, it's either you ask a question to UNRWA or the... the um, Thank you. The, the Assistant uh, Secretary General for Youth at the United Nations. Those are the only uh, interventions I would allow now. So, Iraq, did you, uh, did you want to talk about this? Yes, please. Iraq, you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, thank you. You know, I'm very surprised to hear our colleague from UNRWA spreading these lies that uh, we, belong, we believe come from sources uh, that are completely false. Uh, there, were not, there was not uh, sexual violence on the 7th of October. There were no babies or children decapitated in spite of what uh, has been written in the Western media. Uh, these are lies and uh, they are uh, from uh, Zionist propaganda to attempt to justify the uh, genocidal crimes uh, that they are guilty of uh, uh, in uh, Palestinian uh, territories. So I'm quite shocked to hear that you are also um, spreading these lies. We thank UNRWA for all of the assistance that is provided to Palestinian refugees, but we strongly condemn those words the Palestinian uh, cause did not begin on the 7th of October. We saw militant activities from a resistance movement combating occupation on the 7th of uh, October. We know that uh, uh, it is an illegal occupation. Uh, any people has a, a duty to fight occupation. And We've heard people talking about the need to defend Ukraine against Russia uh, at this assembly. Uh, perhaps the Palestinian people also has a right to defend itself. Most countries are suffering, who have suffered from uh, colonialism had a, a proud independence movement that overthrew uh, the colonizers. And thanks to the use of force, actually, uh, they managed to rid themselves of those colonial powers. And uh, these countries managed to fight for their independence. The Palestinians continue to suffer from occupation for some 75 years now, and they have the right to defend themselves. They have a legitimate right uh, to overthrow their oppressors, who are now perpetrating the crime of genocide. The world is watching. Uh, and uh, is not listening to these cries of distress. And we here have been incapable of uh, agreeing on a call for a ceasefire. It's a disgrace to see the world uh, sitting by watching as uh, children are massacred, children are bombed, going hungry. It's a scandal. It's uh, a disgrace to see the world watching genocide take place and the international community uh, stand still uh, and watches uh, rather than condemning this criminal genocidal regime. I actually have a question for the representative UNRWA. Uh, 
and uh, the, it is as follows. The United States uh, have claimed uh, that uh, some uh, UNRWA personnel have worked with Hamas. These are false allegations. I, w I wish to understand uh, UNRWA's response to that allegation. Please, colleagues, we don't have much time, so please stick your comments to your question or your comments to only two minutes. Lebanon? Okay, Iran? Okay, so is is taking the floor? Okay, go ahead, Iran. Bismillah. Man Farsi, so bad. We can't. Dar vakt khodemun. I speak English. I speak English, and then uh, it will be two minutes only. Since the issues were supposed to be about the young parliamentarians, based on your discretion, I can talk about that from here. Otherwise, I can go to the podium. So can we talk on the podium at 5 p.m.? If you're addressing the two speakers who just spoke, you have to address them from your seat, unless you're talking about something else. I will talk very briefly about what was mentioned, which was unilateral. I just say that the genocide that today we see being perpetrated by the uh, Israeli regime before the eyes of the so-called human rights entities. And uh, also there is a uh, total blockade of Gaza. And today we see that women and young people, in recently, I mean, recent month, 33,000 people have uh, been killed like a genocide and they are denied water and even medicine and the, the, the hospitals are being attacked, and several journalists and um, aid workers have been killed, although uh, they have been somehow safeguarded uh, according to international agreements. And even in previous cases, we hadn't seen such atrocities. So the presence of the parliaments, which, have, uh, which are very powerful within the framework of IPU, and we see that even today in Europe, many people are uh, take to the streets in defending the Palestinians. In Switzerland and other European countries, we saw that people took to the street to show their uh, you know, anger against uh, the Zionist regime. So we expect the government officials to listen to their own people and stop this uh, genocide and atrocities against Palestinian people. Much. Those were the two interventions. I think uh, our Assistant Secretary, uh, United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Youth, hasn't had any questions. So please, UNRWA uh, representative, you can address them on the issues that were raised. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, for the two questions, or the, the comment um, was the second one. From the Iraq, I'd like to, not, um, to acknowledge um, the very warm support from the government of Iraq for, for UNRWA um, over many years, including recently. As regards to uh, the representative's comment on sexual violence, this is a finding not of UNRWA. Um, it's a finding of the Secretary General's representative on sexual violence in conflict in a report that she issued uh, a few weeks ago, um, and I would refer him to, to that report. Um, the representative from Iran mentioned 
by way of example, um, the numbers of journalists killed, uh, the representative of Iraq also mentioned the numbers of children. In fact, by our, I, I would agree with both of them, by, by our calculations, um, there have been uh, more children, more journalists, more UN staff killed in Gaza in the last six months than in any conflict ever. Um, at this rate, uh, at least, uh, in, at least in, since the creation of the United Nations. Indeed, the situation is catastrophic, it is appalling, and it needs to be stopped. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, the two of you, for having participated with us in this assembly, and we, we hope to keep working together with you in our future assemblies. Thank you so thank much, you, and wish you all the best. Okay. Um, dear colleagues, we now go to our special uh, segment, which is on accountability. I would uh, like to welcome you all to the fifth edition of the special accountability section of the general debate. This section is very dear to our hearts as we are member driven institution. Uh, that has a robust uh, mandate to nurture a culture of uh, mutual accountability on all levels. Indeed, an accountable IPU is an organization uh, in which the assembly decisions are taken back to our uh, four corners of the world and translated into national realities for the well-being of the people. When I ran for President, this was one of the points I made during my campaign and will be underscoring during my tenure. We need to walk the talk and implement the decisions that we make here at IPU. We have a duty towards our constituents to suit our actions towards and translate global commitments embedded in IPU declarations, resolutions, and outcomes into national realities. Accountability on all levels also means that member parliaments need to share details on results accomplished in follow-up to IPU decisions to the organization. As per Article 6 and 7 of the IPU statutes, members should share details on implementing the decisions and resolutions they adopt during IPU assemblies and meetings. To facilitate this process each year, a number of parliaments from each geopolitical group are designated to report and answer a questionnaire that the IPU Secretariat prepares and sends in March every year. Of course, all voluntary responses are equally welcome. Based on these responses, the IPU prepares a report and presents in October. I will now give the floor to the representative of Ambassador Ander Philip, who has just uh, gone to another committee, which will also have to report to us at a later stage. And uh, Ander Philip is the director of member relations at the IPU. And now we have our able young person here. And as you know, we are busy empowering the youth also. So she's, he is young and is going to present uh, this report on behalf of Ambassador Anda Philip. You have the floor, Mr. Youngman. Mauricio. Mr. Mauricio. 
Thank you so much, Madam President. I'm here on behalf of Ambassador Philip, who had to go to another meeting. And I just want to make uh, a few remarks on the 2023 member reporting exercise. So as you can see, last year we had a really good response rate with uh, 32 out of the 45 members uh, that were designated to report. Uh, submitting responses to the survey that informed the Secretary General's 2023 report on the implementation by IPU members of resolutions and decisions. Uh, another eight members contributed voluntarily. So thank you, really thank you to all the members that play the game and that provided really good examples of follow-up. We have made an active effort to promote your good practices which, of course, have been showcased in the Secretary General's report at the IPU website and also at the Data and Accountability booth during IPU assemblies. Of course, although the 71% response rate that we achieved in 2023 uh, improved over the last few years, we would like to see all members uh, scheduled to report fulfilling this statutory obligation and sharing good results with us. Next slide, please. As such, we would also like to encourage the geopolitical groups and remind the member parliament scheduled to report to participate in the annual survey on good practices on implementing IPU decisions. Next slide, please. In 2024, we have the members that are displayed on the screen that are scheduled to uh, report. We shared uh, our annual survey with the IPU group secretaries about two weeks ago. And if you have not received it, please email us at the Secretariat and we will be very happy to provide you with a copy of the survey. And in the spirit of uh, accountability and mutual corroboration, we really uh, encourage you to, to respond. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Madam President, and thank you for your kind words. Thank you so much, uh, Mauricio Clauser, for this um, for this presentation. And um, we will all agree, members, that in recent years the IPU has adopted a number of resolutions and declarations, outcome documents, and decisions on various topics, such as climate change gender equality, peaceful coexistence, and humanitarian crisis. Today, we are kindly inviting you to share with your colleagues what you have done to give life to these commitments, particularly in the areas of parliamentary solidarity, to defend the human rights of parliamentarians, and second, parliamentary engagement for the promotion of inclusive societies, and three, parliamentary action to tackle climate change. So you're kindly invited to make the best of this segment and share your best practices, actions, policies, and ideas with the parliamentary community present in the room. And the, uh, the contributions that will be made in this segment will be made from your seats, not on the podium. Uh, but also you will be addressing, because of the time constraints, you may not be able to address all the three issues. You can address one. And I have uh, a list of... Um, Australia, then Azerbaijan. Yeah, I have a list of uh, people who have requested, or rather delegates who have requested the floor. And we will begin with Australia. And this will be followed by a video presentation from the Chinese delegation that has been shared with us. From Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan. I know, I know, but there was a change. Okay, I'm told there's a change. The video will be, uh, the video which will be played first is the one from Azerbaijan, and then Cabo Verde will follow. So Australia, um, Deborah O'Neill, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Madam President. And it is my pleasure uh, here noting that my friends from Tonga are sitting right in front of me here in, in, the, in this forum to report on parliamentary action to tackle climate change. 
Madam President and fellow delegates, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak on Australia's action on climate change in the spirit just described by the, pr the President. Australia recognises climate change as the greatest shared threat to our region and is committed to working with our Pacific Island neighbours and Southeast Asian partners to strengthen climate resilience and fulfil our Paris Agreement obligations. Last year, Australia and Tuvalu signed the world's first bilateral agreement on climate mobility. The agreement is based on the Tuvaluan values of neighbourliness, care and mutual respect, or falapili, whereby our nations have come together to navigate the shared challenge of climate change. By 2050, it is estimated that over half of the Tuvalu capital, Funafuti, which is currently home to over 6,000 people, will be flooded. In recognition of this immediate crisis and under the Australia Tuvalu Falapili Union Treaty, special visa arrangements will be put in place for the Tuvaluans to live, work and study in Australia. In addition to the $16.9 million, in addition, uh, an additional $16.9 million will be provided by Australia for the Tuvalu Coastal Adaptation Project to build the island's climate resistance. The Union Treaty is one of many initiatives undertaken by Australia to support our Pacific Island neighbours. It's complemented by Australia's climate finance, which supports countries in our regions to adapt to the increasing impacts of climate change. In acting on our commitments to climate finance under the Paris Agreement, Australia expects to deliver $3 billion to the global goal of supporting countries in our region to adapt to the impacts of climate change over the period 2020 to 2025. Madam President, I seek your guidance. I can see a red light flashing down there. Does that indicate I should stop my contribution? Madam President, I'm just seeking, is that red light an indicator for all of us speaking? And as soon as the red light goes on, we should cease our contribution. Is that what the process is? What did you say? It's three minutes. It's three minutes. Is it, is it done? Australia, are you done? Well, I was seeking your clarification because once the red light started flashing, Madam President, I wasn't sure if that was for me. Uh, or if okay, it was just sorry, flashing. sorry, sorry, I didn't say in the beginning. It is three minutes, so you still have time. I think there was something wrong there. Thank you. So I, you I... still have, uh, uh, when you started seeking clarification, you, are, you were at your second minute. Yeah, thank you very much. So you much. had spent one minute already. So... Ignore the red light. Yeah, so. Okay. W wait so... a second, put the two minutes instead of three now. Two minutes? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So finally, if I can just conclude, Australia is also active in seeking partnership and securing collaboration with the Southeast Asian partners to address the climate change challenge. Earlier this month at the ASEAN Australia Special Summit, Australia took steps to strengthen its cooperative partnerships with Southeast Asia with a $10 million commitment to a climate and clean energy window. The window will provide multi-year funding for climate and clean energy programs, including technical capacity building, and ensure that Australia and Southeast Asia Asian countries share expertise and learnings. These initiatives are just a few examples of the practical ways in which Australia is working in our region and alongside our neighbours to strengthen climate change cooperation and resilience. I thank the Assembly. Thank you so much, Australia. Now we will have a video from Azerbaijan and then it will be followed by the remarks uh, from Azerbaijan, and then we will have a video from China, and then Capo Verde will follow. Uh, video, please. This is Azerbaijan, a land where the East embraces the West. Ancient and modern cultures collide bright and diversifiable world. Every stone holds a great history. A fusion of various cultures takes place. And the region is abundant with magnificent works of art which are engraved in our history. It's a land enriched with traditions and national wealth, paving a path towards a hopeful and prosperous future.
here, the old Silk Road has left a profound and lasting impact. A heaven nestled between the majestic Caucasian mountains and the vibrant Caspian Sea. This is the place for those who believe in the bounties of nature, cherish the blessings bestowed upon them, and seek miracles in every corner. A land of untold legends waiting to be discovered. Endless green forests, icy waters, sunny fields, and bonfires that burn eternally. A land of peace, covered with the cool embrace of Kazri and warm whispers of Gilavar. This place is like a beacon, illuminating hope for tomorrow, where living in harmony with nature is a way of life. Hospitality thrives in this land, where friendly and triumphant people reside. It's a land where fresh ideas are born, and diverse experiences open doors to fascinating and innovative ideas. And with its vast experience and untapped potential, Azerbaijan stands ready to contribute to a sustainable future. Join us at COP29. Good afternoon. The floor for Azerbaijan. Thank you, uh, Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Azerbaijan has been honored to host COP29 this year. We are sure this exciting event will shed a light to enormous problems challenging by the climate change. We are passing through a very responsible period of transition from traditional to alternative energy. Clean environment and green development are one of five priority areas of the new socio-economic development strategy until 2030. With several projects on renewable energy being underway, the share of the renewables in the total energy capacity of our country is expected to surpass 37 percent by 2030. The fastest way to reduce global warming in the short term is to reduce methane emissions. Azerbaijan has recently announced joining the Global Methane Pledge Initiative, an important voluntary commitment by nations to reduce their emissions of methane. We, uh, last year, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Hungary, and Romania signed a memorandum of understanding on the establishment of a joint venture for the Azerbaijan EU Green Corridor Project. Under this project, it is planned to supply green electricity produced in Azerbaijan through Georgia and Black Sea to Romania for subsequent transportation to Hungary and the rest of Europe. Azerbaijan, which is a traditional player in the energy export scene, has been actively embracing the shift towards green energy. One of its biggest regions, Karabakh Economic Zone, was announced as the green energy areas and applies green economic concept for building here. Additionally, Azerbaijan proposed the creation of a carbon neutral zone by 2050 in the territories liberated from occupation. Azerbaijan is recognized worldwide as a country that makes a great contribution to global climate policy. The fact that the country is also entrusted to host the 29th session of the Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change is an obvious manifestation of the international assessment of this activity and the confidence placed in it. Uh, we decided to be a front runner in green transition and keen to invest part of oil and gas revenues in renewables. This year, the country has set up first electro buses and electro taxis into exploitation. Active participation of private business in solving the climate change challenges is very welcomed and to foster the process, the parliaments will further need to create more favorable legislative actions, for instance, by offering privileged tax corridor for the subject in this sector. Azerbaijan has announced 2024 the Green World Solidarity Year. 
we have uh, plenty of uh, sunny uh, days and we have too much sources for to uh, generate renewable energy. COP29 will be a brilliant chance for sharing experience and will look forward for generating new initiatives. Azerbaijan invites you all to solidarity for green planet. Thank you for your attention. And thank you very much for keeping the time. We'll have a video on China now. China is a country of action in promoting global climate governance and spares no efforts in promoting green development, energy revolution, and international cooperation on climate change, contributing significantly to global climate governments. China leads the world on many counts in terms of a forested area, which accounts for a quarter of the world's total. In the investment of renewable energy, ranking first for seven consecutive years, with the installed power capacity of renewables over 1.4 billion kilowatts, surpassing coal power, and in the output and sales of new energy vehicles, with half of the world's NEVs running on Chinese road. China contributes 50% of the world's wind power equipment and 80% of photovoltaic power equipment, playing a significant role in the declining of the global renewable energy cost and the promoting of the global green and low carbon transformation. The National People's Congress actively plays its part, comprehensively fulfilling its commitments to the consensus reached on the IPU and other multilateral platforms. Important progress has been made in advancing and improving laws and regulations concerning climate change. China has successively enacted and implemented a number of laws in this regard, such as the Energy Conservation Law, Promotion of Clean Production Law, Renewable Energy Law, and Circular Economy Promotion Law, which fortify legal safeguards for China's efforts in addressing climate change and achieving carbon peaking and neutrality. The Standing Committee of the National People's Congress has incorporated the research and formulation of specialized laws for addressing climate change and achieving carbon peaking and neutrality in its legislative planning. In June 2023, the National People's Congress of China adopted the Foreign Relations Law, explicitly stating China's active participation in global environmental and climate governance enhancing green and low-carbon international cooperation. Thank you, Chair. Next uh, speaker is from Cabo Verde. Cabo Verde. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I apologize. We had sent pictures or a video, but for uh, some technical issue, they were not received. So from the Morabeza land goes our commitment towards resilience and the environment. As a small island development state, Cabo Verde has one of the lowest emissions of gases, of greenhouse effect gases, 90% of which comes from the production of energy, but we are among the most vulnerable countries to climate change. In our national determined contribution 2020, Cape Verde has identified five contributions to mitigate, including energy efficiency and renewables, low carbon transport, transportation, nature-based solutions and sustainable tourism, and nine contributions for adaptation, including water management, food safety, coastal management, and uh, land use planning and risk uh, disaster reduction. So we know where we are or where we want to get. In order to do the transition to the economy of um, zero carbon emissions, Cape Verde prioritizes the blue and circle economies and digitalization. This should take us to a reduction of one-fifth of the emissions of the country in comparison to the usual business and reinforce resilience. We have 
ambitious goals and objectives. By 2030, more than 54% of penetration of renewables in uh, the um, production and storing of energy and electricity. We want to achieve 100% of produ producing energy by renewables by 2040, 100% of electric mobility by 2050, and carbon neutrality by 2050. But uh, it's not, that's not all. With the strength of this, the ocean, we are committed to preserve marine biodiversity. Marine parks will be uh, set, offering safe havens to many um, marine species. We acknowledge that we are vulnerable to other risks, volcanic activities, uh, droughts, uh, 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 the floods and rain, leading to mudslides, uh, 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 social importance, the current and future impacts of the uh, sea um, rise levels, and the erosion, all these will uh, be significant to our coastal structure, human settlements and natural ecosystems. We have been thinking about innovative policies to, for waste management in Cape Verde. We are pioneers in the reduction of plastic waste, promoting sustainable practices and making the population aware of the importance of preserving the natural beauty of our islands. Cape Verde as a charter for blue economy policies, a special a maritime economy zone, a sea campus uh, for knowledge and professional development in this department. 7% of the territorial sea is considered as marine areas. An important example that we will present is the recent agreement signed between Cape Verde and Portugal to convert our debt into investment in the climate fund, an environmental fund. We have created uh, a, a path towards uh, sustainable tomorrow. Thank you. Football country, but uh, time is a bit short. We'll, we'll have a video on Chile and then we'll be followed by remarks from Chile. So, video, please. Felipe, Belén, Germán, Marta y Marcelo trabajan en la Cámara de Diputados y son el ejemplo de cómo es posible avanzar en la inclusión de las personas con síndrome de Down. Juntos participaron en la conmemoración del Día Mundial de este síndrome en compañía de representantes de la... This is an example of inclusivity in uh, Chile, and we have uh, a Down Syndrome Association working in the Parliament I am interested in finding out about different kinds of workplaces and people. It's important to have people helped and respected. We have talked about the importance of inclusivity and in legislation that works towards equality. We need to have that inclusivity translated into reality. We need just one educational system in order to ensure that uh, people with Down syndrome can live independently. It cannot be that just because someone has a disability, they find themselves uh, separate from the rest of society. That is not democracy. Felipe, taking the floor for his friends, talked about the need for support from the Deputy Speaker of the Assembly. Today, we, we find ourselves in a situation where women's reproductive rights are being threatened, and this is a tremendous challenge. We do find ourselves in a situation where there is uh, there are problems with respect to those rights and to right to IVF and other issues uh, then there was also need to the insurance that babies with down syndrome are treated the same as everyone and that the equality obtains from birth
Chile Flores de Urso. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, and colleagues. The video that you have just seen is the result of a project that was born in the Chamber of uh, Deputies some 14 years ago. This was a period of 14 years when Down, children with Down syndrome worked with us in the chamber. Why have we shown you this video? Because we in our parliament and in our Chamber of Deputies in the Chilean parliament feel very strongly that it's not just a matter of asking the private sector to change. We have to ensure that those changes uh, are actually brought about in the very heart of democracy, in our Chamber of Deputies. Now, uh, there is one point that uh, I would like to raise through you, Mr. President. Uh, that is one thing that we have not yet come to accept. We have to live with the other as another. If we are to genuinely be inclusive, we have to recognize that uh, the other must be recognized. We cannot find ourselves caught up in our own ideas and our own ways of being. Unfortunately, over the last three days, that has not been the case. Inclusivity is supposed to underpin any political activity. We work day and night to ensure that in the labor, in labor and education, in when it comes to poverty, we do everything for inclusivity, to ensure that everybody can live together. And we want equality when it comes to marriage. We want uh, freedom of belief. We want to ensure that everyone enjoys proper representation. This is what we work on in the Chamber of Deputies in the Chilean Parliament. And what we would like to do, Mr. President, through you, is invite people to, first of all, recognize we need to recognize the other as a real person. Let us emerge from our trenches. Let us recognize the truth. We have to learn to live with the other. And I would like to make a suggestion. We do think that this delegation thinks it's very important that uh, we're talking about inclusivity, we're talking about disability, and I do think that the IPU should have a standing, commi standing committee on the disabled world. That would be inclusivity. Let's not just make statements. Here you've seen a video of children with Down syndrome working with us. And that happened before we adopted legislation in Chile, which involved inclusivity in the workplace. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I totally agree with you, and hopefully the Secretary General have taken note on that and maybe to discuss on one of the committees. Next, we'll, be ha we'll have Mexico to be followed by Indonesia. So, Mexico, three minutes, please. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Fellow parliamentarians, uh, greetings. Uh, I would like to talk to you about what the Chamber of Deputies has been doing with respect to climate change in our chamber. We have a special law on climate change, and it is a law that provides specific responsibilities to the three levels of Mexican government. And this, was, uh, uh, this dates back some 10 years, and this legislation is being constantly updated. The authorities at all levels of government have to act according to this law. We did adjust this framework recently in order to find that we can have com um, cars gradually replaced by electric vehicles. And this is happening throughout our federal administration as well as local, local authorities. We have uh, a law on energy transition as well. And that has laid the foundations for the move towards renewables so that we have fewer greenhouse gas emissions. This means that the Chamber of Deputies is continuing to move for energy policies and their renovation. This shows the significance of our role in the institution because this is not a government priority. We are providing for the need for measurable results, uh, evidence-based work in order to ensure that we have an uh, energy transition. 
we parliamentarians are therefore becoming major players here and ensuring, ensuring that the decisions are taken by everyone rather than having them handed down from above. This is a way of showing that we take climate change very seriously and we have a committee on uh, climate change and sustainability, and this is one of the most active committees in our chamber. It's uh, considering over 100 different uh, pieces of legislation with respect to climate change. In the Chamber of Deputies, climate change is a major consideration. We think it is vital to the well-being of our people as well as our economy. We are sensitive to these issues because we are prey to uh, the results of climate change. We need to protect our natural resources and we need uh, to, uh, as well as our biodiversity and to ensure resilience in the face of climate change. This is vital to us as the Chamber of Deputies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mexico. We'll go to Indonesia to be followed by Tunisia. Indonesia. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, Secretary General, and Honorable uh, Delegates. Good afternoon. On behalf of the House of Representatives of Republic of Indonesia, I would like to extend my appreciation for the Governing Council to provide this special accountability segment. Indonesia's commitment to IPU resolution is resolute and unwavering. We have worked constantly to follow up declaration and resolution relating to a number of issues. First of all, regarding parliamentary action to tackle climate change, the Indonesian House is committed to support green economy transition, including energy transition. We continue to prioritize the finalization of the new and renewable energy bills, phase out fossil fuel subsidies, put carbon market scheme into effect to, and strive to reach the forestry and other land use net sink 2030. In addition, currently we are in the deliberation of the bill of the management of climate change as the legal foundation for the national effort on responding to the challenges pertaining to climate change so that it could be comprehensive, systematic, and integrated. Through this bill, we hope to set the integrated approach in both national and province efforts through budgeting and oversight function. In this opportunity, I would like to also extend our invitation to you to join parliamentary meeting on the occasion of the 10 World Water Forum in Bali co-hosted by Indonesian Parliament and the IPU on May 19 until 2022, uh, 2024, I'm sorry, 19, 2022, 2024. We look forward to seeing you there uh, to strengthen our effort to ensure water security and water for prosperity. Second, with regard to the commitment and on the implementation of Marrakesh communique on encouraging a collective efforts to promote inclusive and peaceful coexistence and to uphold the rule of law. The House of Representatives of Republic of Indonesia believe that diversity is not the source of conflicts. Instead, instead it is a blessing from God through which we could strengthen our solidarity to achieve peace and better society. As a nation which upholds the principle of Bineka Tunggal Ika, or unity in diversity, we strive to promote mutual understanding, dialogue, and respect to diversity to the people. Currently, we are in the deliberation of Bill on Protection of Religious Leaders and Religious Symbols as part of the commitment to make sure that all religious leaders and religious symbols in which these religions are recognized officially by the country and treated and respected equally. To conclude, I would like to reiterate Indonesian Parliament commitment to contribute our parts to promote an inclusive, peaceful and resilient society and at the same time to uphold respect to diversity for maintaining unity and harmony. I thank you, Honorable Chair. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go to Tunisia and followed by Canada. Tunisia, floor is yours. Tunisia.
سيد الرئيس مستر بريزيدنت مستر سكرتري جنرال ليديز اند جنتلمان I'm very honored to be here with you today in Geneva, this beautiful and prestigious city. Protecting the climate and the right to a, a, a clean environment is one of the principles consecrated in the Constitution of Tunisia, which stipulates that no sustainable development can be achieved without a clean environment, free from pollution. Ladies and gentlemen, Climate change is a global uh, crisis that has uh, emerged a while ago, but is felt differently by various countries of the world. But no uh, corner of our planet is free uh, from the impact of the climate change. And right now we notice that the most polluted countries are those that are most vulnerable and most impacted by this crisis. But on the other hand, the developed countries are um, the reasons behind the climate, climate change because of their activities that do not take into account uh, the climate and the environment. Uh, Tunisia contributes by 0.07% in uh, global emissions. However, we are one of the countries that is most impacted by climate change and the scarcity of resources and erosion of the coasts. In the face of these challenges, we are working with all stakeholders closely. We are working with the ministers, the parliament, the civil society, in order to increase our resilience and capacity in the face of uh, climate change. We have put in place a national strategy for climate uh, in 2023 that includes uh, uh, the sustainable development goals in order to be able to achieve Tunisia's commitments in terms of climate change. Uh, at the uh, parliament's level, we are working uh, since 2022 uh, uh, to review uh, a number of uh, climate and environment related laws uh, to be in line with international agreements and conventions. We have reviewed the law of uh, 41 uh, that dates back to 1961 related to the management of waste. We have adopted law number 37 that uh, governs uh, the trade in uh, uh, endangered species. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a critical uh, situation. And uh, we don't have a long way to go in order to achieve the SDGs. Therefore, we call on all parliamentarians to work together in order to be able to uh, shoulder their responsibilities, our joint responsibilities, and to uh, uh, work uh, uh, jointly. Allow me to uh, call on you to provide support to the least developed countries in the face uh, of the consequences of climate change through organizing projects in this regard. We also need to fund programs uh, to allow these countries to face the challenges uh, uh, due to climate change. In conclusion, I would like to say that we are simply borrowing the land and our planet from the future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tunisia, and I would appreciate uh, all the speakers to manage the time. We have, we have very little time today. So now we'll go to Canada and then Suriname. So Canada, please. Thank you so much. It's an honour for me to speak today on behalf of our Canadian delegation. It's also a great pleasure to be with you in Geneva, which must be one of Europe's most livable cities in no small, small part to, to its impressive transportation system. It will be clear to most visitors to Geneva that the authorities have invested heavily in public transportation, which moves both residents and visitors swiftly from point A to B. Our delegation has taken advantage of the public transportation system while we've been here. Active forms of transportation also appear to be encouraged through the availability of bicycle paths and reserved pathways for pedestrians. The mass of bicycles parked outside the central railway station each day is a good indication that active transportation is being used in and around the city, in particular, that important last mile. I'm pleased to say that our federal Canadian government is increasingly playing a part 
to encourage the use of public and active transportation, thereby supporting the green transition. As a federal straight state, transportation in Canada is a responsibility shared between different levels of government. Since 2015, at the federal level, the government has provided more than $20 billion in funding to support public transit projects in communities across Canada. In February 2021, Prime Minister Trudeau announced the creation of Canada's first permanent public transit fund called New Foundations for Public Transit Funding in Canada, which will become operational in 2026. As part of its investment, the Government of Canada is investing $3 billion per year in permanent federal public transit funding, which will be available to support transit initiatives across the country. These investments are intended to help Canada meet its climate targets, since the transportation sector accounts for approximately 25% of our greenhouse gas emissions. Importantly, the federal government is supporting projects that build new and expanded networks of pathways, bike lanes, trails, and pedestrian bridges. In 2021, we launched our $40 million active transportation fund to promote the use of active forms of transport over a five-year period. While these different transit initiatives may not transform our Canadian cities into Geneva overnight, they are an important step in the right direction and we hope that they will make positive contributions to reducing emissions. With respect of the work of the IPU, the Canadian group of the IPU regularly communicates the results of our meetings, including resolutions and statements, to the Prime Minister, the Speakers of the Senate and the House of Commons, as well as the appropriate ministers and parliamentary committee chairs. To give a brief example, during this 148th IPU assembly, the Standing Committee on Sustainable Development is discussing the draft res resolution Partnerships for Climate Action. Once adopted by the IPU, we will ensure it is shared with a range of relevant persons and agencies in Canada. It is clear that Canada continues to act on its international climate commitments, and I look forward to learning from other delegations how their countries are working to meet their climate commitments and how they ensure follow-up to their activities with the IPU. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and hopefully, we'll, hopefully in, your next, in your next visit, you will see Canada better than Geneva. <laughs> we'll go to Suriname to be followed by Denmark, please. Suriname, Suriname. Mr. President, my dear colleagues, good afternoon. The Parliament of Suriname is making progress to build a society which is just and inclusive where gender equality is a must and both men and women have the equal op opportunities and rights. As a nation, we have committed ourselves to promote the rights of women in all areas of the society, which can be translated into the adoption of the different legislations regarding the rights of women. All these legis legislation provi provide a solid foundation and reinforce our commitment to ensure equal opportunities and create a respectful working environment for women. Our parliament has all ears for the needs and problems of the society. Any proposal and working documents from the society are taken seriously and discussed within all faction. If necessary, an initiative proposal will be submitted to the President and the State Council. A committee of rapporteurs will discuss the proposal broadly with all relevant actors. We strive for broadly supported legislations in the benefit of the country. With this policy, we are reducing the gap and building bridges between the parliament and the society to promote an open parliament. Coming to climate change, our parliamentarians have part participated individually and in groups in several activities and conferences to help raise awareness regarding the consequences and effects of climate change among our citizens. Following the international call for parliamentary action to tackle climate change, our parliament has has submitted an initiative proposal to the government to elaborate this important issue into their policy. 
there has been a broad discussion of a draft leg legislation in fireman framework where policymakers are doing their utmost up by setting up institutions to solve impending environmental issues. Suriname is a negative carbon country and the most forested country in the world with 93% forest coverage and a low deforestation rate. We are working towards the build its economy and we also ask to be heard. I would like to ask all my colleagues here to draw international attention to the oxygen we have in the world and to protect the high risk countries. Regarding the fact that Suriname as a country where our forest absorbs a huge amount of the carbon emission, the question that arises in my mind is, can we still believe in carbon credits? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Suriname. We'll go to Denmark and then Latvia. Denmark. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invitation to say a few words during this uh, specially, special uh, accountability segment of the general debate. Uh, I, I have a paper here uh, from uh, the IBU Committee on Human Rights of Parliamentarians. Uh, and according to this uh, paper, in 2023, there was 732 current and former MPs from 47 different countries who were subject to violation of their human rights. Friends, that's a lot. For some, uh, it is restriction of their uh, freedom of expression or deprivation of their parliamentary mandate while for others, it is years in imprisonment, often without any sentence. Any attack on human rights of a citizen is a problem, any. But attacks on human rights of parliamentarians is a particular problem because it undermines the very foundation of democracy. Therefore, the Danish parliament have decided to follow the cases against parliamentarians in our part of the world, in Europe, which have been taken up exactly by this body, which have been taken up by the IPU, follow their cases. Concretely, we do it by sending delegations to court hearings, by uh, sending letters to the persons, and by discussing the cases with representatives for the countries uh, involved. Just one uh, example, and that's one example. We have followed the case of uh, Selahattin Demirtas, who is a leader of a party in Turkey. He was imprisoned in November 2016 and is still today, eight years after in prison. In 2018, he took part in the presidential election in Turkey, where he ran the campaign from his prison cell but still received more than four million votes. The Demirtas case is not only dealt by the IPU and our committee dealing with that, but also with the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, which has demanded his immediate release. And then we have tried to follow up on this case. The next hearing will be quite soon and we will continue to follow up. But I will underline and underline very strictly that this is not about a certain country or a specific country. This is about all the countries and all the 732 people, uh, 62 MPs uh, who is imprisoned. So therefore, uh, we would very much encourage you, as we have done, to do something similar and show parliamentarian solidarity with colleagues in troubles. We need to keep focus. We need to keep focus on the fact that parliamentarians' place is not in prison. Parliamentarians' place is in the parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Denmark. Now, Latvia to be followed by Thailand. Latvia, floor is yours. Uh, dear Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, 
I am honored uh, to be here, and uh, also I have heard uh, this evening so many good examples. Thank you. Uh, one of the hindrances for inclusive societies is hate speech. In Latvian Parliament, we are enhancing our response to hate speech, collaborating, uh, collaborating closely with NGOs and law enforcement authorities. While hate speech is criminalized in Latvia, we are exploring now also more nuanced measures, starting with administrative actions to make it more efficient. And also turning to climate change, uh, we urgently have to go away from fossil fuels. Uh, Latvia for a long time has been dependent on foreign fossil gas, and we were not able to reduce the consumption of it. Uh, the pledge for climate policy, unfortunately, was not as strong as pressure from fossil fuel, uh, gas lobbyists. However, immediately after the Russian aggressive attack on Ukraine, the gas consumption fell just by market response, followed with a ban of imports of Russian gas by 1st January 2023. Uh, currently in Latvia, we have stopped using Russian gas and the overall consumption of fossil gas has dropped by 30%. It is just in a couple of years. And this consumption continues to drop. And uh, what is also my learning point from that? After the start of the war, facing visible threats, we were able to change our behavior very rapidly. Uh, with obvious public support. This proves that in past we did not recognize the threats of climate change as serious enough. Uh, and we as politicians um, need to take more leadership in increasing public awareness uh, about risks of climate change and to explain long-term gains over short-term benefits. So, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Latvia. And thanks for keeping finishing earlier. Uh, we'll go to Thailand and followed by Germany. Thailand, floor is yours. Dear President, esteemed delegates and beloved friends, my name is Pita Limchen Rat, Member of Parliament representing Thailand. And there are three key pillars when it comes to the topic of today, promoting inclusive societies. First is marriage equality. Second is ethnicity and indigenous rights. And third is on the labor protection as part of social justice. On marriage equality, in less than 24 hours, 9,000 kilometers away from here, the parliament of Thailand will convene and decide on a historic landmark legislative on marriage equality that if passed, Thailand will be the first country in the ASEAN to realize marriage equality, one of the first few in Asia to make sure that marriage equality is realized. We say that gender rights is human rights. We say that love is love. And those who are excluded will have the right to plan a family, build a family, and maintain a family when there's medical emergency. On ethnicity, on indigenous rights, we say to the, to the world that indigenous rights also matter. So the cultural differences, the language uh, differences, also the ability to get into the land justice where their origins were formed, as well as the ability to get, into, get included into the education system of Thailand. And finally, on the labor protection, we're talking about promotion of decent jobs. We're talking about gender parity. We are making sure that we all get the paternity leave to get the right work and life balance that every labor deserves in the world. And if this, is, if this is only the beginning of what's going on in Thailand, it's not just laws on papers. It's really sending the message to the world, to the children who might not have the voice that reflect what's inside their soul. We're telling them that it's okay to talk about this. We're telling them that they have a chance to be included in the society within Thailand. So I ask the assembly that tomorrow that you keep your fingers crossed 
and sent your goodwill sheer on 9,000 kilometers away from here to Bangkok, that when it's passed, it's gonna be the victory for the LGBTQIA plus community, not just in Thailand, but all around the world. And it's just, the, thank you so much. And this is the politics of possibilities. It might not be perfect, it might take long, but it shows that if we do it together and we bring down the wall, bring down this barrier and move forward together. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you very much, Thailand. Thank you very much. Next, we'll go to Germany to follow by India. Germany. Thank you very much, dear High Mr. President, uh, Mr. Secretary General of the IPU, dear Martin, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, there are more than one billion people with disabilities worldwide. That is over 15% of the world population. Society often offers them poor health care, less education, fewer chances on the job market, and as a result, they are often poorer than people without disabilities. The COVID-19 pandemic, armed conflicts, environmental disasters, flight and displacement have further exacerbated these inequalities. But the participation of people with disabilities is a human right, not an act of mercy. It is clear to me that people with disabilities belong at the heart of our society right from the start. This is the only way to truly exemplify inclusion and the only way to close the existing gaps between theory and actual practice in our countries. In our opinion, the best way to enable people with disabilities to lead a self-determined and independent life is to create jobs and design workplaces in a way that allows people with disabilities to participate without noticeable barriers. Many people with disability in Germany are very well trained and can contribute to society as skilled workers. Integration into the labor market is therefore a major goal for us. The German state therefore requires private and public employers with at least 20 employees to employ at least 5% of people with disabilities. If this percentage is not met, an equalization levy must be paid. We are able to solve problems caused by long administrative processing times by deciding that applications from employers for financial support are deemed to have been approved six weeks after receipt of the application. In this way, we were able to significantly reduce bureaucracy in Germany during this legislative period and bring people together with suitable employers more quickly. However, our goal worldwide must be to create conditions for people with disabilities so that they can participate fully in social life. Germany is striving to ensure that all development aid projects are accessible to people with disabilities and not just specific programs for people with disabilities. Germany has more than 130 projects in various countries all over the world. It is also clear to me that no single actor alone can bring the necessary change. We should focus on international partnerships and promote cross-sexual cooperation as these are the key catalysts for change. As parliamentarians of this world, we should contribute to breaking down barriers together, including barriers in people's minds. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. And now we are running short of time, and I appreciate the four remaining countries if they can finish each in two minutes. So, India, you have only two minutes, followed by IAO. India? Honorable Chairperson and distinguished delegates. As a proud member of the IPU, India stands committed to upholding the values of transparency and accountability. For the third consecutive year, India is pleased to participate in the IPU Assembly's general debate, particularly in the special accountability segment. This segment provides a valuable platform 
for exchanging good practices, sharing experiences, and learning from each other. Distinguished delegates, India is committed to promote inclusive societies by drawing upon the principle that no one is left behind. India is implementing policies and actions to strengthen societal harmony and foster inclusivity, dialogue, and peaceful co coexistence. The ideal of inclusive development and peaceful coexistence are profoundly ingrained in our socio-political psyche. Similarly, India is committed to promote gender equality and gender-sensitive parliaments. In a historic occasion, during the first day of special session of parliament in September 2023, Parliament of India passed the Women Reservation Bill 2023, which provides for reserving one-third of seats for women in the Lok Sabha and the state legislative assemblies. Distinguished delegates, addressing climate change is another priority for India. We acknowledge the urgent need for parliamentary action to tackle this global challenge. India has been actively involved in initiatives to tackle the negative effects of climate change, and we are committed to implementing legislation, budgets, and scrutiny measures to support the goals of the Paris Agreement and other climate-relevant accords. The pre-summit G20 India. Parliament Forums India. on LIFE, Lifestyle stop for here, Environment, and the 9th G20 Parliament Speaker Summit, P20, held in New Delhi in October 2023, demonstrated India's dedication to democratic values, international cooperation, and cooperative parliamentary efforts to address issues of climate change, global importance, and contemporary challenges. Before conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, India. Thank, sorry to cut Be you, but uh, we have short time. Thank Shall we go to IAO, please? IAO. <laughs> IAO here? Yes. Honorable IPU Secretary General, distinguished IPU members, from the outset, I would like to convey to you the warm greetings and sincere thanks of the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Assembly on Orthodoxy, Dr. Maximos Karakopoulos, for the unique opportunity to participate in the special accountability segment. We must note that this is the first time that an international parliamentary institution under the observer status is actively participating in the special accountability segment. To achieve a peaceful and sustainable future, we must all strive regardless of legal status and formal procedures. Today, I will briefly present to you the activities undertaken by the IAO to promote the Marrakesh communique adopted during the IPU Parliamentary Conference on Interfaith Dialogue on 15th June 2023. The IAO actively contributed in the Marrakesh Parliamentary Conference by participating in a thematic panel and carried out a series of following up actions. First, in June 2023, we held the 30th Anniversary General Assembly in Halkidiki, where we devoted a part of the discussion to the Marrakesh communique and decided that we should share it with our partners so it, is, it receives the widest possible visibility. In fact, the IPU expert, Dr. Sara Markevich, represented the IPU in the Assembly and analyzed the content of the communique. Second, the IAO leadership extended an invitation to the leadership of the Parliamentary Union of the Member States of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation to co-organize co -organize a parliamentary dialogue conference for the promotion of the importance of interfaith understanding of Christian and Muslim worlds. Third, in February 2024, the IAO leadership participated in the International Conference on Parliamentary and Religious Leaders for Coexistence and Peace, organized in Sarajevo, where we once again underlined the importance of the Marrakesh communique. Finally, from the 15th to 17th May of 2024, the IAO, in collaboration with the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union, the Conference of European Churches, and the Organization Together for Europe, will hold an international political conference in Thessaloniki, Greece, on politics as an area of expressing Christian values in everyday life. One of the roundtables of the conference will be dedicated to the Marrakesh communique, 
as a positive model for the involvement of the religious factor in international politics. Thank you. At this point, Thank you I would much. like to conclude the presentation and the follow-up actions. Thank you very much for offering us the floor for sharing our activities. Th Thank you very much. Next, we'll have PMNCH to be followed by Malawi, and that will be the last speaker, Malawi. So, PMNCH, please, two minutes. PMNCH, are you here? No? Uh, greetings, we are here. Unfortunately, our mic is not working, so I'm speaking from the Zambia uh, desk, uh, Spirit of Solidarity. Uh, we bring I bring greetings from the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health, uh, which is the largest alliance for women, children, and adolescents in the world. Uh, we are very pleased to be here with this August gathering of parliamentarians and really uh, happy and excited and gratified to hear about the different actions that parliamentarians are taking in their countries on issues of importance. Uh, we also would like to congratulate the IPU on its sustained focus uh, and growing momentum for the multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary action that it is promoting for uh, climate action, including through the resolution right now on the partnership aspect of taking action for climate change. We would like to urge parliamentarians in this August hall to take every measure possible of national and regional and global accountability mechanisms to ensure that IPU resolutions that are passed in these assemblies are impacted are impactful for the most vulnerable populations which are affected by the global conflicts and the global conditions of the day, especially women, children, and adolescent health, uh, adolescents. In this regard, we would like to share with parliamentarians that the voluntary national reviews that are, undertake, that are going to be undertaken in 2024 please prioritize the issue of national actions on goal 13 uh, for the SDGs, which is the goal that looks at the actions that countries can take in relation to climate crisis. In this regard, I would like, we would like to ask and urge parliamentarians from Argentina, Armenia, Austria, Azerbaijan, Belize, Brazil, Chad, Colombia, Congo, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Georgia, Guinea, Honduras, Kenya, a Democratic Republic of Laos, Libya, Mauritania, Mauritius, Mexico, Micronesia, Namibia, Nepal, Oman, Palau, Peru, Samoa, Sierra Leone, Solomon Islands, South Africa, South Sudan, Spain, the Syrian Ab Arab Republic, Uganda, Vanuatu, Yemen, and Zimbabwe as countries that have committed and raised their hand to conducting voluntary national reviews in the lead up to the high level political forum to please prioritize uh, assessing the actions that countries are taking in relation to climate change and to ensure Thank you that very within much. these Thank discussions, you very much, women, BOCH. children, and adolescents. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have, we have been one, one extra minute have been given to you. So let's close by Malawi. Malawi will be the last speaker in the special accountability bit. So please, Malawi. Mr. President, I am pleased to contribute on the accountability segment report on the theme of climate change. Mr. President, in the context of Malawi, a nation deeply vulnerable to the effects of climate change, Malawi Parliament has emerged as a beacon of hope, demonstrating unwavering commitment for, to combating this ex existential threat. Today, we gather to reflect on the strides made by Malawi Parliament in tackling climate change and to chart path forward in our collective efforts to safeguard our planet for future generations. Mr. President, 
Over the last two decades, Malawi has endured a brunt of climate, climatic hazards, ranging from prolonged dry spells to devastating cyclones and flash floods. These events have wreaked havoc on our communities, jeopardizing food and water security and, and undermining the very fabric of our society. However, amidst these challenges, Malawi Parliament has risen to the occasion, enacting progressive legislation, allocating resources, and exercising robust oversight to address the impacts of climate change head on. Mr. President, one of the most notable achievements of the Malawi Parliament is the enactment of the Climate Change Act, a landmark, a landmark piece of legislation that provides a comprehensive framework for mitigating and adapting to climatic change impacts. This act not only aligns national policies with, with the objectives of international agreements, such as the Paris Agreement, but also mandates the integration of climate considerations into sectoral policies, fostering a holistic approach to climate action. Furthermore, Malay Parliament has played a pivotal role in allocating resources to climate-related initiatives, ensuring that adequate funding is allocated to sectors such as renewable energy, afforestation, and climate smart agriculture. By prioritizing climate change adaptation and resilience building efforts, Parliament has laid the groundwork for sustainable future for our nation. Thank you very much, Anari. I'm sorry we have, we have to close here. Thank, and you. thank you very much for that. Uh, this, will end up, this will end up our special accountability segment. I will go back to the General Assembly, please. Honorable Assemblea, compañeros, colegas. Assembly, colleagues, uh, we're going to continue with our general debate. And Ecuador now has the floor. Por cierto, mi nombre es Marcela Guerra y soy la presidenta de la. Good afternoon, Madam President. Uh, greetings to all those parliamentarians uh, present, present. I am uh, a member of the uh, Ecuador Assembly. It is indeed the case that peace is not the absence of uh, conflict. Peace is also uh, the possibility to dream of better times. We don't have a, we're not at war with anyone, but we have a war in our jails and on our streets. We have a problem with organized crime. Why would a country that does not produce or consume drugs be subject to organized crime and drug trafficking? Because we are suffering the collateral damage of a failed war on drugs. It is indeed the case, colleagues, that the war on drugs has failed around the world. We have people around the world who are fentanyl addicts who are zombies. We have a war that has failed. Cocaine continues to be one of the most consumed drugs around the world. It's it's uh, relaxation for some, it's death for others. In 2023, 8,000 Ecuadorians were killed as a result of organized crime. And in 2016, we were one of the safest countries in Latin America. What have we done in Ecuador? We, we have the army in the streets. But that isn't good enough because uh, we have armed organized crime in government. 
we have those who are imprisoned, who were released by judges, who have actually been paid off by those who've made money from drug trafficking. Why haven't we been able to track this down when we have artificial intelligence tools? Well, unfortunately, AI is in the hands of criminals and not states. Those not in developing countries at any rate and who don't have the means to pay for such tools. We're not in a position to actually make use of a digital means or artificial intelligence. There's another very significant area, and that has to do with tax havens. We have the fact that people trafficking, drug trafficking, generates money for organized crime. Where does that money go? Well, it goes into the black holes that are available internationally, places where nothing is monitored at all. That money has to be stopped. If we can actually stop the funding of organized crime, we would then be able to control drug trafficking. It's not enough to make statements of solidarity. What we need is to have real control over our prisons. Those companies that uh, provide cell phones, for instance, are providing those same services, services for gels. Why is it that we have criminals accessing cell phones and being able to conduct business as usual because they have access to that kind of technology? And we have uh, criminals managing and using that kind of technology. Developing countries cannot finance all of this. So what can we do? We need to ensure that the funding stops and the tax haven stop, but there are other things we can do. We need to have better control over what happens in our ports, all of us in Latin America. Europe, United States also need to have a better control over their borders, because what leaves Latin America ends up in Europe and the United States. This is not just Ecuador's problem, it's everyone's problem. We also need to look at funding and we need to be very, very firm when it comes to the ways in which states deal with these criminals. We have criminals in prisons in Ecuador but they're living very comfortably. In fact, they're more comfortable there than at home. What have we done? We need true sanctions against organized crime. We are not going to let go of this war on drugs because we want a better world. And if we have drug trafficking and addiction, that will never happen. Thank you. Gracias, compañera. Thank you, our colleague from Ecuador. I would now like to give the floor to Russia for two minutes. You have the floor. Uh, uh, it's at so difficult time. Upon the order of the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, we declared the days of mourning. More than 130 citizens died. Many victims are in a severe state. Kids died. Our kids died. I want to express the words of appreciation to all the delegations who expressed their condolences with regards to atrocious terror attack happened in the City Hall, Moscow. I want to get back to the topic of our meeting and commemorate that the new threats and challenges that are emerging in the multipolar world requires us to unite and consolidate efforts of the international community. Unity. We need to enhance the potential of the youth society who are interested in the development of the human being. All of us, parliamentarians and parliaments, need to play the key role. The authority, ability to find a compromise will always play and already play the stabilizing role for the entire system of international relations. They give it flexibility and stability. 
us parliamentarians, we are carriers of democratic legitimacy. We have high authority to express the will of our people and act in the interest of our colleagues. The mission of parliamentary diplomacy is promotion of the uniting and constructive agenda, harmonization of humanitarian contacts, strengthening confidence and trust between peoples and countries. We need to invest maximum efforts to make parliamentary bridges in the interest of peace and understanding to prevent uh, violence and terror attacks. Colleagues, once again, we are so thankful for your support, for your understanding, for your empathy, for your sincere condolences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Russian Federation. Guyana has the floor now for three minutes, and Lithuania will be the next, the following speaker. Thank you. Mr. Secretary General, Madam President, it is a pleasure to be here. It is the great Martin Luther King Jr. who said that peace is not the absence of war, but the presence of justice and brotherhood. Parliaments bring together the largest number of the most powerful elected leaders on the planet. This mighty army can easily be the greatest global agency of change, including procuring lasting peace and understanding. The IPU being the largest global association of parliaments, with its grounding principles that dialogue is central to peaceful resolution of conflicts, is ideally poised to achieve this objective. Unfortunately, at this conference, we failed to harness this energy and marshal our thoughts to condemn the worst human rights tragedy in the world, Gaza, and the lack of democracy in Venezuela. These horrendous events, although occurring at opposite sides of the globe, together manifest the deadly havoc that armed conflicts wreaks and the social disorder and human sufferings that the absence of democracy produces. More than 30,000 are dead in Gaza. Nearly 8 million refugees have fled Venezuela. There is another dimension about Venezuela which I wish to highlight. Venezuela continues to unlawfully claim two-thirds of the sovereign territory of its western neighbor, Guyana. This claim by Venezuela was finally and conclusively settled by arbitration in 1899. Venezuela accepted and acted upon this arbitral award for six consecutive decades thereafter. It was not until the early 60s, when Guyana was about to gain independence from Great Britain, that Venezuela made the outrageous claim that the arbitral award was unlawful. It continues to make this spurious claim to date without producing a scintilla of evidence to substantiate it. Right here in Geneva in 1966, Venezuela signed an agreement with Guyana, inter alia empowering the United Nations Secretary General to take steps to resolve the controversy. In, in 2018, exercising those powers, the UN Secretary General referred the matter to the International Court of Justice where it remains pending. Thus far, Venezuela has refused to accept the court's jurisdiction or to be bound by any order the court makes. Venezuela has threatened physical invasion and in December 2023 moved a referendum to annex two thirds of Guyana's sovereign territory. The ICG has issued interim measures restraining Venezuela from taking further steps in its declared intention. Every major international organization in the Western Hemisphere has condemned Venezuela's action and have called upon Venezuela to respect the jurisdiction of the ICJ, to comply with international law, and to employ diplomacy in resolving this alleged dispute. These include the United Nations, the European Union, the Commonwealth, the Organization of American States, the CARICOM community, and the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. Many governments, including the United States, Canada, Great Britain, Brazil, and those of the Caribbean, have issued similar statements. Significantly, by virtue of an intervention broken by CARICOM and CELAC, 
The presidents of Venezuela and Guyana signed an accord in Argyle St. Vincent in December 2023, inter alia, declaring not to take any steps to escalate this conflict, but to resort to diplomacy and dialogue in resolving it. During all of this, Guyana has maintained em emphatically that the matter must be resolved by the ICJ. Border Guyana has always maintained that diplomacy and Favor dialogue conclude, must Senor prevail Rados. over threats and confrontation. Last week, in breach of both the letter and spirit of these interim measures granted by the ICJ and the Argyle Declaration, Venezuela government enacted laws in this parliament to annex two-thirds of Guyana's sovereign please conclude, territory. Se, me, please conclude, one minute. Colleague. I appeal to each one of you to use the theme of this conference and the platform of your respective parliament to condemn the actions of Venezuela, to demand compliance with international law, and to call for diplomacy to be used as a bridge for peace and understanding. This is not a favor to Guyana. It is discharging a duty we owe to ourselves, and indeed the world, if we are to remain true to the founding principles of this great organization. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you, Guyana. I would urge speakers to stick to their time limit. Lithuania has the floor to be followed by Thailand. Uh, dear Madam President, dear friends, uh, it was a huge, uh, important uh, job uh, done by our parliamentary IPU meeting uh, uh, through all those days. Uh, and I would like to add something essential. I am uh, in my parliamentary activities more like 30 years. And uh, my mother spent years in concentration camp in, in Germany during the Nazi occupation. So the all rules of the Second World War, all conventions, human rights conventions, United Nations, Council of Europe Convention of Human Rights was based on uh, the answer to the brutality of Second World War, the answer to Nazi regime. And it was built the system of law and uh, uh, obligations. From my point of view, my mother just passed away and she told me clearly, I never hope, I never have in mind that it's where we will be coming to the Third World War brink. I'm just urging Russia Federation to stop their aggression against Ukraine, to stop repressions against Russian Democrats inside of Russia, and uh, co cooperate with United Nations and C Council of Europe and other uh, bodies to establish international commission to evaluate Alexander Navalny's death. It should be done by uh, uh, creating a um, serious attitude to our democratic uh, uh, obligations. And in this great hall, it's uh, important to say that it's not a case that uh, Russia Federation get rid of us with nuclear weapons in the case of their war upon Ukraine. So in this case, it's not a case that uh, international justice can be sub subjugated to the one dictatorship. It's not a case when you have not free, not fair elections, and the president of not free and fair elected country will be treating the Democrats in uh, creating jail and repeating Joseph Stalin experience. I would like to say thank you so much and very pity that we have no resolution on Ukraine this time. It is great honor to being among you. Thank you for all your resolutions. Thank you for all your attitudes and all your votings. Thanks a lot. Gracias. Thank you, Lithuania. I now give the floor to Thailand to be followed by Ireland. I would urge you to please uh, stick to your speaking time. Thank you. Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, esteemed colleagues, sawadikha. With the escalating conflicts and fragile global peace, Thailand firmly believes that now is the time for parliamentary diplomacy to pursue our common agenda for peace, prosperity, and sustainability for all in the spirit of multilateralism and solidarity. As for our foreign policies, Thailand has long pursued peaceful collabor collaborative relations with all members of the international community based on mutual trust, understanding, and respect. 
We believe that long-lasting peace can be achieved through sustainable development. Therefore, Thai parliamentarian will do our utmost to bring SDG back on track. Also, we fully support ASEAN's collective efforts for diplomacy. De-escalation, peaceful means to achieve sustained peace in the region, including the situation in Myanmar. As an immediate neighbor, it is in Thailand's vital interest to see quick return to peace, reconciliation, and stability in Myanmar. The Thai parliament thus welcomes our government's recent initiatives to establish humanitarian corridors along Thailand and Myanmar borders to upscale humanitarian assistance without politicization. Finally, I wish to reaffirm Thailand's intention to support the agendas of the IPU, be the peace, security, development, climate change management, commitment to democracy and human rights, and the promotion of partnerships between stakeholders at all levels. Our young MPs are determined to work closely with all nations and partners through parliamentary diplomacy and to meet these challenges head on. I thank you, Madam President. Muchas gracias. Thailand. Thank you, Thailand. I now give the floor to Ireland and uh, Burkina Faso will be the speaker after Ireland. Mr. Secretary General, Madam President, delegates, I stand before you today not only as a young parliamentarian but also as a woman parliamentarian. We know that peace is promoted through economic equality, gender equality and all groups being treated as valuable members of society. We as parliamentarians must commit to having more women in parliaments and more women in senior leadership positions in parliaments. We need seats at the table and the top seats at the top table. As the saying goes, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And we don't want to be on the menu any longer. For too long, the patriarchal systems of government have worked against women and led to poorer outcomes for societies globally. We say no more. No more to harmful practices such as FGM and other forms of violence against women and girls. No more to threats to reproductive rights and health care. No more to gender income inequality. No more to unequal access to education, nutrition and health care for girls and women globally. We need to fulfil the sustainable development goal number five. Conflict and war has always disproportionately impacted on women and children. Let us use this assembly to build bridges, engage in diplomacy, and commit to ceasefires and lasting peace and cooperation. Populism and polarization are huge threats. They damage our countries and make them less secure. And instability grows out of this insecurity. In this year of elections in particular, I would urge all parliamentarians to reject populism and polarisation and other divisive means to gain support. It is incumbent on us to be honest with our electorate and bring people together. Delegates, I will leave you with a quote from President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Life is never easy. There is work to be done and obligations to be met. Obligations to truth, to justice and to liberty. Thank you very much, delegates. Gracias, Irlanda. Tiene el uso de la palabra. Thank you, Ireland. Burkina Faso has the floor to be followed by Iran. Madame la Présidente. Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen, as a young parliamentarian from uh, Burkina Faso, I am honored to take the floor before this IPU assembly. I would like to talk to you about the effect of conflicts on young people and the way in which they have been marginalized from decision taking. Indeed, young people are 
have to deal with armed and or social or political conflicts, and all of these conflicts have a devastating effect on young people. It's not just a matter of material loss and psychological damage. It's also a matter of the systematic marginalization and neglect of their fundamental rights to participate in political and social life. When we look at conflicts occurring throughout the world, we can see a troubling development. Young people are often the first victims of these conflicts, and they are the last to be included in peace and reconciliation. They are not heard, their voices are drowned out by the noise of weapons, and they have to suffer the uncertainty and instability that occurs. It is, however, imperative that this change. We need to find a way of recognizing the huge potential young people represent when it comes to peace and stability. They are the ones who have overwhelming desires for change, and we cannot disregard the role they can play. We need to invest in the education and vocational training of young people, and we need to provide them with the economic employment opportunities. We need to build their resilience and ensure that they can make a contribution to their communities. We, as parliamentarians, have a duty with respect to young people. We have to ensure that they are not only heard, but taken into account. In conclusion, Ladies and gentlemen, we really have to do something now to get out of this vicious circle. We need no, to get out of violence and exclusion, and we need to ensure that young people can actually fulfill their potential. That will lead to a world that is more fair, more peaceful, and fairer to present and future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Burkina Faso. Iran has the floor to be followed by New Zealand. In the name of God, the compassion, the merciful. Madam President, Excellencies, dear colleagues, young parliamentarians of member countries, parliaments. First of all, I would like to express my pleasure to be present among the honorable heads of delegations and parliamentarians of the member parliaments of the Interparliamentary Union. I congratulate the New Year or Nowruz to the countries of the civilizational area of Nowruz and also uh, the holy month of Ramadan. Madam President, today we are talking about parliamentary diplomacy for peace and understanding in a situation where the young population around the world has been exposed to many dangers. War climate change and food crises are among the challenges that threaten the life and development of the young generation. The situation of the Palestinian young youth and their massacre is a perfect example of the threat of extension of the young and future generation in Palestine. Today, the Palestinian people, including women and children and the youth, don't have uh, food due to the genocide perpetrated by the Zionist regime. Today we are talking uh, we are talking about the situation of the Palestinian youth when the future generations of that country have been murdered, lost their families and become displaced while struggling with the monster of death under the worst living conditions and com complete siege as a result of the cruel and predatory actions of the terrorist war machine of the Zionist regime. How can we talk about a future for Palestine when the Palestinian youth have been the target of torture, killing and genocide for a long time? Efforts are underway to make homeless the young generation of defenseless Palestinian nation and expel them from their um, fatherland to implement the sinister and old Zionist plot. In this context, we need a united voice and a decisive action to support the young and future-building Palestinian generation. Parliamentary diplomacy as a tool to create peace and understanding will be realized when equality and justice for young people around the world are achieved. 
designing any obstacle and unilateral coercive action and violating international law and human rights will prevent the growth and excellence of the young population around the world. The right to peace, the right to development, the right to access to health, and the right to education are among the fundamental rights of young people in today's world, which have been endangered, endangered to, uh, due to the arbitrary and illegal actions of some irresponsible actors. Unilateral coercive measures, including unjust sanctions against certain countries and the Islamic Republic of Iran, have brought about problems for the youth, imposing huge costs on them. Sanctions have been even made scientific and research activities difficult for researchers and the youths. Nonetheless, this has led to the fact that our youth have doubled their efforts, creating obstacles against the transfer of educational technologies for education and acquiring skills for young people, disappointing them in uh, developing countries regarding their development process, creating centers for spreading false information and making the young population of these countries less willing to participate in building the country are unfortunately among the measures adopted by certain global capitalist centers to push the young towards passivity. I am sure that the honorable delegations will pay attention to the fact that the cooperation and consultation of the parliaments of the IPU members to create a single voice in dealing with youth issues will lead to the creation of a safe future with peace and prosperity for future generations throughout the world. Thank you. Trust the youth so that these... Please, could you conclude, uh, Speaker? Finish, please. Time is over. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Iran. And please, could I urge speakers to respect their time limit? New Zealand has the floor to be followed by Austria. Tenakoto Katoa. In New Zealand, we have a proverb. Naku te roro no te roro ka ai te iwi. With your basket and my basket, the people will live. It is a constant reminder that sustained peace cannot be achieved alone. Sitting in these rooms, I have been frustrated listening to politicians discuss what will be written on a piece of paper and determining the value of a human life. I'm here to talk about peace. Peace can only be achieved when we do not allow a nation to tell us that their human lives are more valuable than another human life. New Zealand is a small country, and we rely on international law to be upheld and for nations to be held to account when it is not. I know my children's lives are no more valuable than your children or any children in the world. We must be committed to upholding human rights, indigenous rights, and nonviolent conflict resolution. I am devastated and outraged at the loss of over 30,000 Palestinian lives since October 7th. Hostages from Israel and Palestine must be released, and there must be an immediate ceasefire. The Green Party of Aotearoa New Zealand is part of a global movement working to change politics, to put people and planet first. We see the crises facing our planet as connected and requiring solutions that stretch across borders. Every single child in this beautiful world deserves to be able to trust adults in power to put their needs first, to end poverty, to end pollution and to face up to the climate crisis. Ka ora te whenua, ka ora te tangata. When the land is well, the people will be well. Will you stand up for justice and peace for our children? I say free West Papua, free Sudan, free Congo, free Palestine, and toitu te tiriti. Kia ora. Thank you, New Zealand. Gracias, Nueva Zelanda. Thank you very much. 
Austria. Madam President, uh, Secretary General, dear colleagues, in our world shaken by multiple crises, I would like to emphasize the importance of multilateral organizations and multilateralism in general. We need a strong political discourse based on compromise in order to find solutions for diverse crises and risks in these trying times. As a young parliamentarian, I'm worried about the stability of democracies in the upcoming years. While the world seems to be more and more divided, keeping multilateral dialogue is both a challenge but also crucial for finding solutions. We achieve more stability by finding compromises with more actors involved. It may be more complicated, but in the end, more of us end up winning rather than keeping out important point of views of our partners and having to renegotiate afterwards. There are many examples that prove how beneficial multilateralism can be. Uh, think about international law, uh, which is a cornerstone of our modern world. Or think about the Schengen area, for example, in European Union, um, which has led to more freedom for so many individuals in the member states of European Union. Without multilateralism, this world would be a different one and not for the better. It is therefore important to strengthen the bonds among states with same goals and same aspirations in order to work towards a common goal. The best way to achieve this is via multilateralism. And trust me, it's always better to have a multilateral compromise rather than having no compromise at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Austria. Gracias, Austria. Thank you very much. Brazil has the floor. Gracias, por favor. I'd like to uh, greet uh, all those present here and the chairwoman of this assembly and uh, say that it's an universal truth. We choose what we, uh, we reap what we plant, no matter where in the world where we are. We we'll always find ourselves uh, earlier or later uh, with the consequence of our acts. Today, there's an enormous global a worldwide effort to bring to reality a decarbonization policy as a remedy to try at least to minimize a series of misguided choices that we humans have adopted in favor of an unbridled economic growth. We are at a historical moment in which two paths are clearly outlined in our pro prognosis and the complete Either we choose the destruction of the planet through the embridled use of our finite assets or the path of change, the path where we look around, recognize ourselves as a community, and seek together to change the course of our history. There are many signs of this, this destruction, and here I bring to the attention of the world through you, who represent the 140 nations present here, the case of the biggest urban environmental tragedy and the way in the world. And that unfortunately happens in the city of Maceo, Alagoas in Brazil, where 60,000 people have been forced to leave their homes because the multinational, multinational mining company Braskem has been indiscriminately exploiting rock salt in urban areas for more than 40 years. 40 years in an urban area exploiting, I repeat, rock salt indiscriminately without proper inspections and creating gigantic caverns under the houses of 60,000 people without their knowledge. And that has already caused the sinking of neighborhoods, uh, creating cracks in the homes and lives of thousands of people, as well as irreparable damage of the, to the city and the environment. Finally, 
I call the world community to help and support to seek fair redress for people who suffer this tragedy and for environment. I also draw attention to needs to strengthen and take the environmental rules and forms of mineral inspection series so as strengthen not to witness tragedies which can be avoidable like this one which are uh, and, and unable to come back together. And I'd like to ask this International Assembly to uh, create a specific committee to follow up this uh, environmental crime which is happening today in Maceo. Thank you. Brazil, gracias, Brazil. Honorable Assemblea. Distinguished Assembly, I now wish to give the floor to Morocco, who will stay in their, in their seat to, to uh, give a right of reply. You have two minutes. No, no, desde su lugar. You can stay seated. Thank you, Madam President. I want to uh, 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 take the floor on behalf of the Moroccan Declaration for the right of reply in response to what was mentioned by the representative of Algeria, who repeated the same story once again about the uh, Sahara and uh, uh, mentioned these lies in this uh, meeting. I want to uh, correct some of the information and reiterate that once again, the issue of the Sahara is uh, before the Security Council, uh, contrary to what he pretended. Uh, as he said, it was referred to the ICJ. This is something that has been decided uh, with regards to Morocco. Uh, there was a proposal, and this proposal uh, is supported by the international community. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Morocco. Distinguished Assembly. Could you show your flag? No, I'm not giving anyone any the floor. There are no um, replies to replies. Um, so that statement concludes the general debate. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everybody, for your ideas and uh, contributions. See you tomorrow.